The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. And we're going to need some readers again. Um, what we want to do is we're going to read Revelation. We're going to look at uh, the background of Revelation 21 this morning in the Old Testament. See how that helps us understand the symbolism. Remember, we're looking at symbolism, and I'm, I'm just sorry we can't um, have a full course. Um, because I can only choose certain things uh, that are just snippets uh, of the book of Revelation. So we're just getting little snippets here. But what we're doing here today is we'll be looking at a biblical theology of the temple. It's really a summary of uh, my book, The Temple and the Church's Mission, <clears throat> which is a shortened form um, published by uh, InterVarsity Press. And it's called um, God Dwells With Us. A biblical theology of the temple and uh, the first uh, edition was subtitled expanding eden to the ends of the earth and that really gets at the idea expanding eden to the ends of the earth and so we're going to look at a biblical theology of the temple as the background behind revelation chapter 21 so we're uh, we're going to be writing an interpretative bull this morning so hang on okay if I go too fast, raise your hand. Yesterday I went too slow, but I wanted to make sure <laughs> that first lecture is so important. Uh, I wanted to make sure that, you know, um, that everything was somewhat clear. I never assume I'm completely clear. So chapter 21, I'd like someone to read, <clears throat> uh, starting at verses uh, one through three. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll have that person continue at verse 9. Any, any, yes, sir, please. Thank you. Start now. Yes, and we'll, we'll, so we'll read uh, God's word here, Revelation 21, and then we'll uh, open the prayer. Um, so if you start, please. And I, I'll probably stop you to get someone else because it's a lot to read. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. If you would continue with, uh, with verse 9. By the way, it's so, it's so nice to hear a, a, a good, solid Southern accent. <laughs> I, I, I love it. My wife and I were confined to uh, the Northeast and Midwest for about 43 years. So it's, it's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> continue. Thank you. Uh, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Let's see. If you'd start, just skip that and go to verse 9. Okay, start with verse 9. Yeah, please, thank you. Uh -huh. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit the great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed. 
12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 140 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Okay. Let's get someone to read verses 19 uh, all the way through 22.3. Any follow uh, Thank you so much. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedonium, the fourth emerald, the fifth sar sardix, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysa chrysoprase, the eleventh and the twelfth amethyst. Hey, stop right there. You know, it's hard enough to read those in English. <laughs> Try Greek. <laughs> These are once occurring words, most of them in the New Testament. So they're not words you normally run across. I remember taking a course on the Greek text, uh, Greek exegesis, the book of Revelation in seminary, and um, having to uh, translate this passage, I, I had to look up every one of these uh, Greek words, and, and, and they're very hard to translate. So, so some words we're just not sure about them. Uh, so as I've studied it since, I felt a little better at my inability to translate uh, that passage. So um, if you think it's hard to pronounce in English, just try it in Greek. All right. So continue, if you would, at verse 21. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. The kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. For there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, only those who are written in the life. And he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. All right. Um, I'll read verse 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. So everybody will be in God's face. And the fact that the name is on the foreheads means that everybody's a high priest now, which is amazing. Uh, that is not now, but in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, anybody want to open us in prayer? Um, and one of you pastors who are uh, used to praying uh, the congregational prayer, but not that long. <laughs> just, a, just a brief prayer. Oh, yes, sir, please. Our Father, we are grateful to be here today. We're grateful for a night's rest and for the privilege of uh, sitting under this teaching and, and hearing about these glorious things. God, we long to be in your presence as we've just read. We long to see your face, Lord Jesus. Uh, we love you. We thank you for your shed blood. We thank you for your uh, sacrifice for us that we might be forgiven of our sins. We pray you would forgive us of all of our sins. Help us, Lord, to receive this teaching today, uh, to be instructed well, to be uh, encouraged uh, in teaching these things. And we pray, oh Lord, that as we go forth, uh, we would strive to live as priests uh, in, in, our, in our context. Thank you, Lord, for this time, and we pray you bless our brother as he teaches us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you look in the margins of your Bibles, if you have margins in your Bibles, and hopefully you have a margin, uh, a Bible that has a margin, um, and again, uh, if you don't have the Novum Testamentum Graeca, uh, Mesolalon 28th edition, uh, even if you don't know Greek, you need to get that. Um, my wife doesn't know Greek, and she's got it, and um, so she's she's using the the margins uh, together with her treasury of scripture quotations, um, <clears throat> which I also use. Now, 
if you look in the margins, you'll see a lot of Old Testament references, whether in the Greek text or in the English text. And I think uh, what that tells you is that the key to interpreting this passage is the Old Testament. In fact, I think if you don't know uh, the Old Testament, you're going to have a hard time interpreting the new. It's all over the place. As I mentioned yesterday, um, uh, the references to the Old Testament are mainly in elusive form, not in formal quotational form. And so if you're not tracing the allusions and recognizing them, you're missing most of uh, the use of the Old Testament and the new. So I hope that you'll uh, uh, use those margins. And we'll even uh, look today at how important the margins are. But as we look at this text, there is a problem here in Revelation 21. Why does John see a new heavens and earth? We saw that, right? Verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why does he see it? And yet, in the rest of this vision, he sees a city that's in the shape of not a temple, but the Holy of Holies, and it's garden-like. And the city's called a bride as well. So... Um, you would expect if you see the uh, something that says, and I saw new heavens and earth, and then it's going, he starts describing it. We are going to see, I saw the valleys and the mountains and the rivers and the tundra and the seas and the lakes and et cetera. We don't get any geographical information at all. It's weird. I saw new heavens and earth, and then he says, I saw a city in the shape of the Holy of Holies that's garden-like, and the city's called a bride. Um, that, that, why is that? Um, <clears throat> now, it's possible that John sees the new heavens and the earth, and then he just decides to focus in on a city called the New Jerusalem, and then in the city is a temple, and, uh, or the Holy of Holies, and uh, it's garden-like. It's possible that that's what's going on, but I don't think it is because we're going to see, in fact, that the new heavens and earth is equated with the city uh, uh, in the shape of the Holy of Holies that's garden-like. And so uh, we have to ask that. And the first thing that I want to show you is just some of the uh, Old Testament references that, that, if I can say it this way, conjure up a temple atmosphere. And the first is Ezekiel. Ezekiel 40 to 48 is sort of the famous vision of the future temple. And by the way, people often ask me, can you tell me what that means? And uh, it, it's kind of hard to summarize that in a short conversation. But I do have a chapter on it in my book, The Temple and the Church's Mission. And um, generally, I will say, I think it's symbolic need for a future temple. And we'll see, I'm going to contend that it's inaugurated in the church age and consummated in um, the new heavens and the new earth. That's all I'm going to say about that vision at this point. But having made reference to that vision, there are some Old Testament references to the temple in Ezekiel. For example, if you look at verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. Well, that's from Ezekiel 37. 27, which really is then elaborated in chapters 40 to 48. And then if we skip down in verse um, 10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. If you look at Ezekiel 40 and verse 2, that's exactly what happens to Ezekiel. He is put on a high mountain. He looks uh, at the city. So, so John is kind of a latter-day Ezekiel here. And then in verse 11, it says of the city, having the glory of God. Now, that phrase, having the glory of God, is from Ezekiel chapter 40, and uh, actually 43, um, and verse 2, where uh, the glory of God shone on um, uh, the temple and the city. And then, you remember, around chapter 47 or 48, there, there are these gates around the city, 12 of them. And that's what we find here in um, verse 12. Had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. Names were written on them, which are those of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then it goes on to say, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three on the south, three 
on the west, and just as it was in Ezekiel. So uh, all of these things associated with the temple are uh, mentioned here. Um, and then, uh, very interesting, we read about these precious stones uh, that, that are uh, very difficult, especially in Greek. Uh, we read about them in verses uh, 18 through, um, through 20. Um, by the way, it, it talks about um, one of those stones being uh, Jasper. Well, when I was writing, finishing chapter 21, we happened to be in Maine. I was substituting for a pastor who was uh, on, on vacation up there. And so we were up there for about three weeks and, and there was a beach nearby called Jasper Beach. And so uh, it was called Jasper Beach because the stones on it were Jasper. So we went and I remember collecting the stones. We were going to polish them up and uh, that sort of thing. I think we still have the bag of those stones unpolished, but uh, we thought that was very interesting. A, a beach that has nothing but Jasper stones. I've never seen that before. Um, so uh, these precious stones uh, are, they, they have a precedent and that precedent is in Solomon's temple, which was also the foundation was overlaid with gold and uh, the foundation was composed of precious stones. Uh, actually, uh, the, the Holy of Holies and, and the Holy Place was overlaid with gold and then the foundation uh, was composed of precious stones. Uh, so it's a definite allusion back to that. So what am I doing here? I'm just trying to show you that this is a... Um, uh, a vision that certainly has to do not just with a city, but with at least a temple. But now it's not just a temple. Look with me at chapter 21 and verse 16. The city's laid out as a square and its length as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. Now that phrase, its length and width and height are equal. Uh, for those of you who are closely acquainted with the book of First Kings, that should have a ring about it. And the ring about it is in uh, 1 Kings 6.20, where it says, quote, the length and the breadth and the height of the Holy of Holies was equal in measurement. This is a definite allusion back to uh, 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 20, so that the city, notice verse 16, the city laid out as a square, and how's it laid out? It's laid out as the Holy of Holies. So the city's in a square shape. This is very weird. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, chapter 22 tells us this is garden life. Verse one, he showed me a river of the water of life. There's crystal. Verse two, in the middle of its street on either side of the river was a tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. And um, it's very interesting there that the tree of life, this is weird, look at verse two, it was on either side of the river of life. I mean, is this some kind of huge tree that has roots on either side? Probably we're talking about a forest of the tree of life here, just as you might refer to um, uh, you know, some woods that, that are mainly oak. You'd say, look at the oak. It's not just one tree, it's a group of trees. So probably here, we're talking about the escalation of the Garden of Eden because in biblical theology, when the end comes, we're not just talking about a reconstitution of the Garden of Eden. We're talking about that plus an escalation of the Garden of Eden. And this is one of the, one of the ways to show the imagery of the escalation. You got not just one tree alive, you got a forest on either side or at least a, trees, plural trees of life on either side. It's one of the elements of the escalation here. So what we have here is uh, 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 a garden-like city in the shape of the Holy of Holies. And uh, indeed, um, the city is also called a bride. We'll also talk about that. So, but how can we explain the apparent discrepancy that John sees a new heavens and earth and the rest of the vision, he doesn't see any geography. He just sees a city in the shape of the Holy of Holies that is garden-like. Um, as I said, it's possible maybe to think that, well, 
he sees the new heavens and earth and he zeroes in on the city and in the city is a temple. I don't think that's the case because there's an equation in this passage, an equation of the new heavens and earth with the city in the shape of a garden-like temple. And I want you to see that. You'll notice, first of all, chapter 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 2. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, probably verse 2 is further interpreting verse 1. New heaven and earth. What is it? It's a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. And then verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. As I said, that's from Ezekiel 37, 27. That's elaborated on in chapters 40 to 48. But when you hear a voice in the book of Revelation, it usually is an interpreting voice. Usually you have a vision and then a voice, and that voice, whether it's from God, Christ, uh, uh, exalted saints, or an angel, it interprets. And so here we, we have seas of new heaven and earth, holy city. What's that? It is uh, the tabernacle. Um, this is a pattern throughout the book of Revelation. Uh, and sometimes it's turned on its head. Sometimes you'll have a declaration. Then a vision will interpret the declaration. You remember chapter five, the famous passage where he hears about a lion from the tribe of Judah who is conquered. And the very next verse says, and I saw a lamb standing as having been slain. So how does the lion conquer? Uh, that's what he hears. It's interpreted by the vision. Uh, a lion conquers by being a slain lamb. So you have this juxtaposition, and here you have the vision, and I think it's interpreted by the interpreting voice in verse 3. But furthermore, that the, um, the, the city is equated with the new heavens and earth, I think is evident if you turn to chapter 22, and uh, you need it. It's a little uh, harder to follow, but I hope I can uh, present it. Chapter 22, verses 14 to 15, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to enter uh, uh, right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Verse 15, outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the immoral persons, murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices lying. If you read some commentators, they'll say, here we have the new heavens and earth, the eternal new heavens and earth. And you, you got God's people in the city and around it, you got eternal hell because the, 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 these are the people who are uh, uh, unbelievers and, and uh, this same these same classes notice where they are in chapter 21 and verse 8 for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars most of those are the same classes as in 22 15 their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death so uh in the new heavens and earth, you'll just have unbelievers also together with believers separated by a wall. And the unbelievers are in the lake of fire. Um, so uh, that's kind of problematic uh, to think that uh, unbelievers will be in the new creation with uh, believers and that the lake of fire is right around the walls. Uh, I think a better view is, is this, that what we have is uh, a different dimension. These people, these unbelievers, are in the dimension of the lake of fire, which is outside the city, and, uh, and, and I think it has to be outside the new heavens and the new earth. So the city represents the new heavens and new earth, that uh, uh, the lake of fire uh, is in a different, a different dimension of. So um, I think that... Uh, uh, that shows that the city in verse 14 being outside of the place where the unbelievers are, uh, it's got to be in a different dimension. And what is that dimension? It is the dimension of the new heavens and the new earth. So I think there's an equation of the city with the uh, new heavens and earth there, which um, is outside the dimension of hell, if you will. So, uh, in fact, what we'll see, in fact, that John is equating the new cosmos with the city temple and the garden as we go on today. But kind of the picture is, I don't know how many of you are um, 
Trekkies, those of you who might uh, have watched uh, Star Trek, but uh, in one of the um, episodes, there's the planet of the cyborgs, and it's a square planet, okay? By the way, Star Trek is still on, for those of you who have not watched it, it's still on. There's, you know, escalated uh, uh, episodes or different movies that have moved on, different, episodes, different uh, series, but the old Star Trek is still on. And um, I encourage you to see it. <laughs> so, um, uh, parenthetically, one of the best old movies I've seen uh, is called Forbidden Planet. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's like mid 1950s. It's, uh, you, you, you've got to see that. The biblical theology of it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, but you got to Google that or find it somewhere and watch it. Um, so, uh, we're, we're going to see indeed that there is this equation. Uh, and we're going to see that more than what I presented here as we go on. So again, why is the new heavens and earth equated with a city in the shape of the Holy of Holies that is garden-like? We've got to go back to the Old Testament to find the answer in the margins. The margins are crying out, please look at me, and it will help you understand uh, this passage. So as we go, what we're going to do is go to the Old Testament. And I decided when I was thinking about this, I wrote a little uh, a two page excursus at this point after chapter 21 in my commentary and uh, trying to explain this. And then I expanded that into 400 pages in my uh, in the church's mission. That's very, very true. Uh, seriously. And uh, so I went back, I said, the first place we got to go probably is Genesis 1 to 2, because there are some allusions here, especially to the garden, to Genesis, well, 1 to 3. Uh, for example, there's no curse there. Um, and obviously, the tree of life is referring to uh, the Garden of Eden. So we have to go back. And the first thing that I want to say here uh, in uh, the um, overheads I have is that... Um, the Garden of Eden was the first tabernacle or temple. The Garden of Eden was the first tabernacle or temple. Um, so I, I want to argue that, uh, I try to demonstrate that. Many people have not considered that that is a possibility. Not all commentators agree with it, but I think the following points show that Eden was the first temple. Now the word temple, or sanctuary is not used in Genesis 1 to 3. Therefore, some commentators say it's not there. My contention is if it feels like a temple and if it smells like a temple and if it yeah, tastes it like a temple, then it probably is a temple. Uh, the same thing we say about ducks. And so um, uh, and we don't want to make what, what we refer to in biblical studies as the word concept confusion. In other words, some think, if the word isn't found in your passage, uh, then the idea is not there. So if the word temple or sanctuary is not found, the idea cannot be there. And uh, it, it, this is like, parenthetically, some who think that the doctrine of sanctification can only be found where the Greek word for sanctification is found, like hagiazo and hagios and hagiosmos. Those are the words usually for sanctification. And, and so if you study those words, and that'll give you the biblical theology of sanctification throughout the New Testament. And it, it certainly will help. But there are plenty more places where sanctification is talked about in the New Testament than just where the words occur. So you don't have to have the word to have the concept. But if you don't have the word, then you really got to show the concept is there. And so uh, the word is not here. But I'm going to contend the concept is. And so number one. The garden was the unique place of God's presence. Remember, Moses had to go into the tabernacle to hear God speak, and then he would communicate God's word to the people. And so also the Garden of Eden is the place where Adam and Eve experience God's presence and hear him speak. Uh, remember, uh, uh, they're there, and he says, where are you? He's starting to speak to them uh, after they have sinned. And, and the word right before uh, that speaking, remember, it says God was walking back and forth in the garden. That's the phrase, and that is a particular Hebrew uh, word, uh, and even the verb form 
uh, is what we call in Hebrew a hithpael, which is kind of a reflexive uh, verb form. And it's the word walk. And when you use it in the hithpael, it's, it's walking back and forth uh, in a reflexive way. And that word intriguingly, and the same verb form, it's a participle, is found in Leviticus 26, 12, Deuteronomy 23, 14, or 15, and 2 Samuel 7, 6 to 7. And that refers to God walking back and forth in the tabernacle. Uh, now it is used uh, other times, that participial form, it doesn't refer to the temple, but three of the eight times that it does occur, it refers to God walking back and forth in the temple. So that may be a little uh, tip of the iceberg that, that we're uh, talking about uh, Eden being a temple where God walked back and forth in. Secondly, the garden was the place of the first priest. Uh, again, some people say, really? Uh, Adam has priestly clothes? No. Uh, well, we don't see them. Where does it say Adam was a priest? Well, Genesis 2.15 says, God placed Adam in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. So the two Hebrew words for cultivate and keep can easily and usually are translated serve and guard. And when these two words occur together later in the Old Testament, without exception, they have this meaning of serving and guarding. And they refer either to Israelites worshiping God, serving and guarding or obeying God's word. Uh, that's about 10 times. And five times when this word combination is used, it refers to priests serving and guarding the temple, keeping uncleanness out or obeying God. So um, uh, the, the words are, for those of you who uh, do some Hebrew, uh, the words are um, uh, abad and shamer, abad and shamer, abad uh, usually serve, most texts translate it cultivate and shamer guard and so adam uh, uh uh that he was to be the first priest to serve and and guard god's temple may be evidenced by these words now it's interesting uh if you look at uh, egyptian temples that in their courtyards they had gardens and priestly duty there was to cultivate the gardens so it's very possible to translate this as cultivate and guard in the sense that cultivation was a priestly duty in this, uh, in this, in this tabernacle. You find, by the way, uh, similarities between pagan temples in the ancient Near East and uh, with Israel's temple. They were all in three parts, for example, holy of holies, holy place in the courtyard. So does that mean Israel was just sort of, you know, merging and reflecting the pagan temples uh, uh, I think it's really probably the other way around. I think that probably after the flood, we know that there was um, uh, uh, the history about the Garden of Eden and leading up to the flood that was transmitted as oral tradition, at least by Noah onward, so that Moses picks that up and is able to record it. And so um, likewise, some of that oral tradition probably was filtered out into the uh, unbelieving world as well. Uh, the special revelatory uh, history of the Garden of Eden is, is expressed in scripture, but uh, pagan temples probably had some common grace idea of, uh, of the Garden of Eden temple. So that probably uh, when, when they describe or build their temples, it's similar to Israel's. Israel's is the true one and uh, the others are faint uh, uh, resemblances of, uh, of the original Eden Garden. Uh, Israel's temple, as we're going to see, is uh, the true developed replication of the garden. But it could be translated serving and obeying, um, especially if uh, there's no mapik at, at the end of, of the haze, uh, for those of you who know Hebrew, but I won't go further on about that. They could be infinitives. Um, uh, but even if it's translated cultivate and guard, the idea is wherever else these two words occur, they're always serving and obeying. So there would be the ring of it, uh, uh, the idea of serving and obeying as it's used elsewhere. Now, when Adam fails to guard the temple by sinning and letting in an unclean serpent to defile the temple, it's interesting. Adam loses his priestly role. The two cherubim take over the responsibility of guarding the garden temple. And um, but before we further talk about the two cherubim, I think probably the best evidence 
that Adam was a priest is found in Ezekiel 28. So I'd like you to turn there in your Bibles, Ezekiel 28. Now, Ezekiel 28 is addressed to the king of Tyre, who's a very arrogant person. He's talking, talking about his imminent judgment. So verse 12 of chapter 28, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre. Say to him, thus says the Lord of God. The Lord God, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Well, he wasn't in Eden, the garden of God. Well, what's, what's going on here? This is a difficult passage. I think probably what we're doing is uh, we're looking at the judgment on uh, uh, the king of Tyre, but then we're going back and see why he's being judged because he's part of the corporate lump uh, connected to Adam and Adam's fall. Uh, we're going to see that I think we immediately go back behind the king of Tyre to his ultimate representative which I think is the first Adam. And so I think that's what, what's going on here. Uh, and so he says, I think he's beginning to talk about the first Adam. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, uh, turquoise, the emerald. The gold workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day you were created. They were prepared. Now, verse 14 says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, uh, that could be referring to the fact that he's an actual angel. And so some, therefore, take that to mean this was Satan in the garden. Many evangelical commentators have taken it that way. This could merely be a, um, a metaphor. You were the anointed cherub, like uh, scripture, Psalm 23, you know, God is a, a father. God is a shepherd. I mean, literally, shepherd or uh, uh, or whatever. Or God is um, a lion, uh, not literally a lion. Um, and so this this could merely mean uh, you were cherub. Uh, you were an angel uh, in the same way that well, God is a shepherd. Uh, you were like, in other words, you were like. Um, uh, a cherub who covers the Greek Old Testament translates it as you were with the anointed cherub. So uh, it doesn't say that Adam or that this figure was a cherub. He was with the cherub. Um, so uh, I, I don't think that this is saying that um, this figure was a cherub, but he was like a cherub. And the earliest translation of this passage separates this figure uh, from being an angel. So we're going to move on. I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And then it says, by the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence. You sinned. I cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I've destroyed you, O covering uh, cherub. Uh, and by the way, that, that word there, uh, oh, covering cherub is guardian cherub, I believe with the word, if I recall right, of shamer, same word used as guard in uh, Genesis 2 and verse 15. So um, again, uh, I've destroyed you, oh, you who are like a covering cherub. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Then now notice verse 18, uh, by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profane, profane your sanctuaries. So uh, if this is talking not about Satan, and, and there's debate about it, but we have nowhere else in scripture where Satan is described as falling in the Garden of Eden. There's nowhere. And um, we do have in Genesis 1 through 3, a very clear description of someone who fell in a garden. I think that Ezekiel is referring to that. And, uh, and that that's why he goes, uh, talking about the judgment of the king of Tyre, he goes behind Tyre to the first Adam, the one who represents Tyre uh, as a fallen person. But notice verse 13. Look at those stones there. That verse is based 
on Exodus 28, 17 to 20. Guess what that's talking about? Anybody remember what that's talking about? The priest jewels, the jewels on the, on the priest's uh, ephod. And it's human, okay? This is a human priest here. It, it further probably indicates we're dealing with a human here as well. And so um, uh, this is priestly clothing. It's, it's definitely, all commentators agree, this goes back to Exodus chapter 28. Yes, do you have a hand? Is it okay to rise? Yes, yeah, please. Um, what, uh, I, I just would love to hear your thoughts. You know, we, we so identify Adam being covered after he sinned. Yeah. And uh, these jewels yeah. to constitute a covering. Well, how, think, how do you navigate I that? I think that they reflect the glory of God. And then, uh, you know, when he falls, all that falls away. Is it, did, when he knows he's naked. Like, and yeah. Would you understand it more as like metaphorical jewels of the beauty of God reflected in Adam as an image bearer? Or That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, if it were purely metaphorical, uh, it would still resonate with this priestly idea uh, that, that he uh, in some way is is configured as, as, as a priest. So I'm not concerned main, to try to get to the bottom of that. Either way, I think it would reflect, that's my point, that it reflects a, uh, a priestly uh, notion here. Whatever it, it may, it may just be, if it is purely metaphorical, it would be the idea that Adam reflected the glory of God. One way to say that is that um, he was covered with jewels. It's like uh, Revelation chapter four, uh, uses some of these jewels. Um, and for example, chapter four, verse uh, three, he who was sitting, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. Uh, and there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. So you, you have these stones. Why are they mentioned there? I think to reflect the glory of God. Um, so um, it's, it's possible that that is the case, that the idea is uh, that this was what your clothing was like in the sense of what its effect was reflecting the glory of God. And we, we also know that uh, later on that, that we read in chapter 21 that uh, verse 11 says that the city having the glory of God and it says her luminary, her light was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear Jasper. So the glory of God is directly and inextricably linked with the light of the city. It was like a costly stone. So again, it's connected with a reflection of the glory of God. So it, it, it's possible. Okay. So uh, that's all I wanted to do was show that um, we, we have the description of the clothing. It's priestly clothing. It comes from Exodus chapter 28. Now, when Adam fails to guard the temple by sinning, and letting in an unclean serpent to defile it, he loses his priestly role. The two cherubim take over the responsibility of guarding the garden temple. And uh, we find in verse 24 of chapter 3 that God stationed the cherubim to guard Shamer. That's one of the words used, showing that they're taking over this uh, responsibility and this duty of um, Adam. He stationed the cherub, cherubim to guard the way to the tree of life. So, um, by the way, the Greek uh, Old Testament's uh, statement that uh, this figure was with the cherubim makes sense because here we have the cherubim in the Garden of Eden uh, clearly with Adam, and then they take over his role. And in fact, later Israel's priests were to do what the cherubim were doing and what Adam was to do. They were to guard the temple using that Hebrew word shamer for guard. Uh, they were to, quote, keep watch our guard, Shamer, at the gates of the temple so that no one should enter who was unclean. In quotation, they were called gatekeepers, gate guarders, uh, 2 Chronicles 23, 19, or Nehemiah eleven nineteen would indicate that. Uh, their role became memorialized, I think, in Israel's later temple when God commands Moses to make two statues of the angelic uh, figures and places them on either side of the ark to indicate symbolically their guarding uh, of um, uh, the ark of the covenant. Um, now, furthermore, then, 
uh, the next one, number four, the garden was the first place of the first arboreal lamp stand. Uh, the tree of life was probably the model for this lamp stand in Israel's temple, right outside the uh, Holy of Holies, if you remember. And uh, what did that lamp stand look like? This is very interesting. Uh, uh, Exodus 25, 31 to 36 describes it. It was um, a small tree trunk uh, of an almond tree with seven protruding branches, three on one side, three on the other, and then uh, uh, one branch going straight up as uh, from the trunk in the middle. Uh, so why would you have a lampstand look like a tree? Uh, in, the, in the holy place. That's the second section of the, of the temple. Uh, I think one of the best explanations is, together with what we're going to see here pretty soon, uh, all the other imagery in the temple that goes back to Eden, that this, this probably also reflects Eden. And so that brings us to the next point. The garden is formative for garden imagery in Israel's temple. In 1 Kings 6, 18 and verse 29, we find the following quote. In the temple, uh, when it was created, there was, quote, cedar carved in the shape of gourds and open flowers, verse 18. Quote, on the walls of the temple roundabout, uh, end quote, and on the wood doors of the inner sanctuary were, quote, carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, verses 29 to 35. Now, beneath the heads of the two pillars, remember there were two pillars right at the entrance as you came out from... Uh, as you came from the courtyard into the holy place, two pillars placed at the entrance of the holy place, quote, were on them, um, were carved pomegranates. First Corinthians 7, verses 18 to 20. So why do you have this imagery of all these flowers and pomegranates? Where does all that come from? Well, some would say, well, some of the ancient Near Eastern temples, and etc. Well, where did that come from? Um, Again, I think it all has its ultimate source uh, in, in Eden and the traditions from Eden that came through Noah that Moses recorded inerrantly and probably got uh, um, distorted uh, as, as it was uh, filtered out into the common grace realm of unbelieving uh, civilization. Now, furthermore, look at the next point. Um, there are three things that I want to uh, say here that um, the very bottom, the garden was the first source of water uh, and it was the place of the first mountain. I'm going to problem getting to the bottom of this here, that bottom part, let's see. Here we go. The garden was also the first place with an eastern entrance. So I'm putting those three together, just as Israel's later temples and her end time temple were number one to be on a mountain. I have references here. Number two were to face east. And number three, water was to flow from them. So also Eden. If you notice what we read in, in uh, uh, Ezekiel 28 and um, verse 14, you were on the holy mountain of God. So definitely Eden was uh, on a mountain from which water flowed, uh, as we know, uh, Genesis 2.10. And uh, also it faced east. We know that from Genesis 3.24, that there was an eastern entrance. So that's more than coincidence, I think. Later temples, I think, were modeled on uh, the, Eden, um, the Eden temple. By the way, just a parenthesis. If this figure in Genesis 28 were Satan, uh, then he's presented as a priest. Okay. Hmm. And he's in the Garden of Eden. Okay. So uh, what it shows, what this would show is still the Garden of Eden was considered uh, a temple with a priest in it. And the first one was Satan. So I don't think it's Satan, but even if it's Satan, my point I think is still made that we have a priestly figure. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, uh, now, furthermore, uh, we'll go to the next slide, and uh, here we have, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, some of these, but the second one, the garden is part of a tripartite sacred structure. Uh, you remember, uh, and we're going to look at this in more depth, that the temple of Israel and her tabernacle had three sections, 
the Holy of Holies, outside of it, the holy place, then you go into the courtyard. But that was also part of the temple, by the way. The Holy of Holies was most holy. The holy place was second uh, in holiness, and then the courtyard was still holy, but not as holy as the inner two. So you've got three holy uh, uh, sec sections there. Um, and uh, Eden also, you have the waters uh, uh, that are talked about. Uh, Eden is actually the source of the waters. It is not the garden. The garden is the garden of Eden, the garden in relation to Eden, and uh, where Adam was. And then the outer inhospitable area was uh, uh, the third section. And so uh, probably later temples were, were modeled on this rough uh, uh, garden-like tripartite uh, division. Um, now, so, so far, I, mainly what I've been arguing is it smells, it looks like a temple, it tastes like a temple, therefore it's a temple. Let's not make the word concept mistake, just because the word isn't there, probably uh, we, we have a temple idea. But did you notice, if you still have Ezekiel 28 open, look at what happens to this figure who's cast down to the garden. After 28, verse 18, by the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profane her sanctuaries. Oh my gosh. Eden is seen to have sanctuaries. But why plural? Because there are plural sections, not only of Israel's temple and the tabernacle, but also of Israel. There, there's, there, there's the Holy of Holies, which in this case is Eden, the waters where God dwells. And then there is the holy place, uh, and in this case, the garden where uh, Adam uh, lived and worked and then uh, the outside territory. So um, uh, here, the garden is named, this name, by the way, of sanctuaries is applied to Israel's temple uh, in, in the prophets because there are multiple sanctuaries in the temple. So, um, and there were in Israel as well. So, hey, we no longer have to say it smells like, it tastes like, it looks like. E Ezekiel says it was. It was sanctuaries. Now, the irony of this is the, is the following. Dan Block, a fine Old Testament scholar and a friend and colleague at Wheaton College Graduate School, um, he disagrees uh, with my view that the Garden of Eden is a, a, a temple. And uh, when some students decided, uh, when I reached a certain age, I won't say, but when I reached an age, they said, let's write a book and get some of Beale's friends to write a book some articles in this book. Okay, so they did. And Dan Block, my friend, wrote the first chapter. And the first chapter is why Eden is not a temple. <laughs> <laughs> and as you read on, it's why Greg Beale's wrong. And so, uh, but we're good friends. Um, you know, we, we uh, I mean, this, this is not the gospel, you know, we agree on the gospel, you know. And so uh, we're good colleagues. But you know what's interesting? He is the scholar on Ezekiel. So I read his commentary. And uh, he, he doesn't make a point about Eden being a sanctuary. The irony is, here's the place where Eden's called a sanctuary. And he wants to argue it's not. And it's not, he, he doesn't uh, recognize it in his Ezekiel commentary. Very interesting. I have not discussed this point with him. Um, but uh, it would be fun to do so. Maybe we'll have a cup of coffee or whatever with he and his wife. He and, he and his wife, I and my wife would go out with Douglas Moo and his wife have dinner and that sort of thing. So we were good friends. So um, that's just a little caveat. The reason, by the way, he thinks that Eden is not a temple. He just says, look, the later tabernacle and temple borrowed from Eden. But that doesn't mean that Eden is a temple just because the later temple borrows from it. Now, I think scripture interprets scripture. I think later scripture interprets earlier and early interprets uh, uh, the later. And so um, I, I think it does mean that, but Ezekiel cinches it. Ezekiel takes the vagueness out. It was, it had sanctuaries. So uh, even early Judaism, intriguingly, there's an early book, not canonical. My wife becomes... Um, a little irritated when I start referring to non-biblical books. 
but uh, one of the earliest Jewish books, the Book of Jubilees, considered uh, in the canon of the Old Testament by the Ethiopic Church, by the way. Um, I don't think it is myself. But, um, in Jubilees 8, 19, it says, quote, no one knew the Garden of Eden was the Holy of Holies and the dwelling of the Lord. He knew that Mount Sinai was in the midst of the desert. Mount Zion was in the midst of the navel of the earth. The three of these were created as holy places, facing one facing the other. So it's interesting that he equates the um, Garden of Eden with uh, Mount Zion, which was the temple, you know, had the temple on it, and equates it with Mount Sinai as a temple. That's interesting. If you want a good argument for Mount Sinai being a temple, <laughs> Just drift down the hallway, <clears throat> stick your head into Dr. Morales's office. He's written a book on Sinai as a temple. All right. So we'll just assume that's true. Um, <laughs> okay. It's a good book. It's a very good book. Uh, so not only was Adam to guard the sanctuary, but he was to subdue the earth, according to Genesis 128. Quote, and God bless them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that creeps on the surface. But, but how does Genesis 1.28 relate to Adam in the garden? Um, well, uh, we'll go to our next slide here. Let me just see. When are we supposed to finish? 10. We'll, we'll see what we're going to do here. <laughs> How does Jesus 128, that commission? And by the way, I think that's the great commission, not, not Matthew 28, okay? Matthew 28 is a subsequent commission, referring back to the first great commission. Genesis 128, how does that relate to um, Adam in the garden? Well, first you can see he's an image of God, by the way. In the ancient world, where would you place an image of God? In you, you, you would place it in the temple and you would place it in the Holy of Holies. And so what do we have here? Is it by accident that Adam is said to be in the image of God? And then in chapters two and three, we have a temple. Adam is placed in the temple, but now he's not a dead stone image as in the uh, pagan temples. Adam is the living image of God who is to reflect God's glory. And that's why I think those stones are important because it shows he's to reflect God's glory. Um, so, um, God bless them. That's Genesis 128. He's in the image of God. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and probably fill the earth with glorious image bearers. They're in the image of Adam. So they are to reflect the glory of God too. That's the way it should have been. He was to rule over all the earth. So, uh, one commentator has said this, if people were going to fill the earth, According to Genesis 1, okay, it says fill the earth in 128. And if people were to fill the earth, um, we must conclude they were not intended to stay in the garden in a static situation. Yet moving out of the garden would appear a hardship since the land outside the garden was not as hospitable as that inside. Perhaps then we should surmise that people were gradually supposed to extend the garden as they went about subduing and ruling. Extending the garden would extend the food supply as well as, as extend sacred space. That is, extend the presence of God. It's not just geographical extension, but uh, presence of God extension. So what this means is that Adam, I think, was to widen the boundaries of the Garden of Eden in ever-increasing circles by extending the order uh, of the garden sanctuary into the uh, inhospitable outer spaces which includes most of all spreading out and extending the special revelatory glorious presence of God. And this would occur especially by Adam's progeny in the image, progeny in the image of God reflecting God's glory. So um, as, as they went about uh, extending of the light of God's presence, uh, they would eventually fill the earth. And um, so that the whole earth would be filled with the glory of of God. So uh, this meant the presence of God then, which was limited to Eden, was to be extended throughout the whole earth. So what we have then uh, is uh, the garden was the unique place of God's presence. 
uh, Adam, the first priest, the girding cherubim take over his priestly role. Garden was the first place of the tree-like lampstand. It was formative for garden imagery in Israel's temple. It was the first place where you have a mountain which has an eastern entrance with water flowing down from it. And, uh, and then you have the garden is tripartite. And then Ezekiel <clears throat> does a slam dunk and says, this is the garden. So, um, uh, and what we have here then is, uh, we're gonna look further at Genesis 128 in a moment. It's gonna be very, very important. Um, so uh, as we know, Adam was not faithful. Um, but that he was to extend the garden. Right now, this might seem like a surmise or a deduction, not something explicit. And I agree, but I think it's there that Adam and his progeny were probably to expand this garden, but we're going to see this expansion will become clearer and clearer as we go along this morning. Um, as we know, he was not faithful and obedient, so that not only was the garden temple not extended, uh, throughout the earth, Adam himself was cast outside of the garden sanctuary and did not enjoy any more God's presence. He lost his function as God's priest. Now, let's just stop, and then we'll take a break. Uh, but we're going to stop and talk and then take a break. Um, so far, I think what we've done is answer two of the four questions of uh, Revelation. In other words, why is the new heavens and earth equated with a city in the shape of a temple, specifically the Holy of Holies, that is garden-like? Well, I think we've answered that. The whole new heavens and earth, uh, well, the um, pristine, unsinful, incorrupted heavens and earth before the fall, if Adam had been faithful, he and his project would have gone out and eventually that whole earth that had been created for him knew uh, that that uh, the whole earth would have been um, garden and temple, wouldn't it? Because uh, he would have extended, he and his progeny would have extended even to the ends of the earth. It's a subtitle of my popular shorter book. Uh, they would have extended even to the ends of the earth. So they would have extended, extended the sanctuary of Eden to the whole earth. Whole earth would have been sanctuary and whole earth would have been garden. So now we can see, finally, that's been achieved. In Revelation, as we'll see through Jesus Christ, the last Adam. That's why you have new creation equated with a garden and with a temple, i.e. Uh, the Holy of Holies. So we've got, we've got most of this answered. We now have to ask, as we go along, where does city fit in? So we'll have to uh, answer that as we go along. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's just take maybe a uh, five-minute break here, okay? Okay. Um, so we, we left off with, uh, we, we've answered two of the three basic questions. Why is the new heavens and earth equated with um, a garden and a sanctuary or a temple? And we've answered that. The whole point was to extend Eden to the ends of the earth so that all of the earth would become garden, all of the earth would become Eden. And the new heavens and earth now is presented as those two things. Finally, uh, those two tasks have been accomplished, as, as we'll see, because of the work of the last Adam. Um, after Adam's fall and expulsion from the garden temple, uh, humanity became worse and worse, and only a small remnant of the human race was faithful, as we know. God eventually destroyed the whole earth by flood. It has become so thoroughly wicked. Only Noah and his immediate family were spared. Now, uh, we could uh, actually ask ourselves, uh, is there any evidence of uh, temple building with Noah? Um, most scholars don't think so, but I know two scholars uh, who are pretty good scholars who think so. So I'll at least present their view, which is very um, intriguing. Some think that the, uh, the ark was a sanctuary. Uh, number one, in Greek, the Greek word for ark is kibotas, and that's the word for the Ark of the Covenant in Greek, uh, the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle and in the temple. So the words are different in Hebrew, but in Greek they're the same. Secondly, the Ark had intriguingly three sections, three major sections. 
uh, just as the later tabernacle and temple and the earlier Garden of Eden. Thirdly, uh, there were detailed architectural plans. And when you find detailed architectural plans, the, those are always related to building a temple in the Bible. And fourthly, this would have been the place of God's special revelatory presence with humanity, as the garden was with uh, Adam. And uh, fifthly, remember when Noah gets off of the ark, what does he do? He uh, builds an altar and offers a sacrifice. Uh, he functions as a priest. And finally, if you read closely that Noah narrative about the animals, uh, there's a distinction between clean and unclean animals. Well, where is that distinction important? Well, it's later important for the tabernacle on the temple because only you have to distinguish clean from unclean in order to offer sacrifices. Only uh, clean animals can be sacrificed. So uh, th th these are some intriguing uh, observations that, that there may have been uh, the beginning of a temple. If so, it was not completed. It was halted because of the disobedience of Noah and his sons who followed in Adam's sinful footsteps. In fact, I have uh, in another lecture, you can, uh, you can see how many similarities there are between Noah and Adam. First of all, Genesis 128 is applied to both of them. And uh, secondly, they both sin in the garden. Uh, they need to be covered and so on. Um, Noah's presented as another Adam figure, not a second Adam, because Christ is the second Adam as well as the last Adam, but he's another Adam figure. And so um, what we then find is that the, uh, uh, after this disobedience of Noah and his sons, God starts over again. He chooses Abraham and his descendants, Israel, to reestablish his temple. And so what we find here in this first, um, over, in this overhead here, uh, is that uh, the commission of Genesis 128 is applied to Abraham. Now, we're going to read some of this in a moment and some following uh, slides, but um, you notice at the top, I talk about a gap between Genesis 1 through 11 and 12 and following. A lot of scholars, when they get to chapter 12, it's like they're starting a, a new book almost. There's not a lot of integral discussion on how 1 through 11 relates to 12 and following. Now, there's some essays two or three essays that do a good job on this. Uh, one commentator, Gordon Wenham, makes a very small comment in his commentary, but uh, usually there's not seen to be a very integral relationship, but there is, and we're going to see that the integral relationship especially is Genesis 128, that uh, Adam, uh, that commission given to him is applied to Noah, and then we're going to see it's applied to Abraham. Here's the beginning of that. Uh, the commission of Genesis 128 uh, is, is repeated to Abraham. I'll greatly bless you. Remember it starts, Genesis 128? God bless them. I'll greatly multiply your seed. Remember, uh, multiply and increase. Uh, your seed will possess the gate of their enemies. Uh, well, Adam did not need to possess the gate of enemies because there were no enemies. Now, after the fall, to uh, uh, subdue the whole world, you've got to subdue some enemies as well. And uh, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So you get this universal aspect of that the, all of this will affect the whole earth. Remember, fill the earth uh, with image bearers reflecting God's glory. So um, then get uh, this passing on of Adam's commission uh, was to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to Israel. And uh, I think what this means is that uh, Noah and Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Israel uh, have the mantle of Adam. Um, uh, Abraham, the patriarchs, uh, represent Israel, but then when it's passed on to Israel, they are a corporate Adam. Now, that doesn't mean that they're living in some kind of unsinful situation. They're not like Adam in that sense at all, but the commission is passed on to them. In that sense, they have this, um, this commission passed on to them, and so uh, let's just look at some of that briefly. Here it is with uh, Noah in chapter 9. God blessed Noah. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, populate it. That's very clear. Uh, and then Genesis 12, uh, to Abraham, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you, make your name great. So you'll 
be a blessing and I will bless those uh, who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, this uh, statement here in the middle of uh, chapter 12, verses two to three, so you shall be a blessing. Sounds like it's a promise, a prophecy. It's an imperative in Hebrew. It's be a blessing. It's a command, be a blessing. And so what we find is uh, with Adam and Noah, there is no promise uh, directly connected with Genesis 1.28. I mean, we do have Genesis 3.15, that there will be a seed uh, that's not directly integrated with Genesis 1.28, and uh, neither is it here in with Noah. They're just commands. This is a command. But beginning with Abraham, you get the promise, the Abrahamic promise that his seed will multiply and they will bless the nations. Uh, and so you get a man together with promise. He is to be a blessing. That's a command. Genesis 17, he's to circumcise his children. That's part of the covenant there. And so you get both command and promise. Uh, Adam, Noah, the patriarchs, Israel, they fail in obeying this command. But nevertheless, beginning with Abraham, there we begin to get that promise, which surely does indeed pick up. Uh, Genesis 3.15. So at that point, you have Genesis 3.15 integrated into the promise. And um, so uh, here's chapter 17. We're still with Abraham. And you can see uh, I have the different colors here uh, showing the, the major allusions to Genesis 1.28. I'll multiply you exceedingly. I'll make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, and ultimately, ultimately the earth. Still with Abraham in chapter 22, I'll greatly bless you. I'll greatly multiply you. Uh, and then at the end, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So you get the, um, uh, uh, the universal aspect of uh, filling the earth from Genesis 1, And then with Isaac, sojourn in this land, I'll be with you, bless you. I'll give you all these lands. I'll multiply your descendants. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed. I'm just looking at the uh, uh, coloring here that refers back to Genesis 1.28. And, uh, and we continue now with Jacob. The Lord appeared to him the same night, said, I'm the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, do not fear. I am with you. By the way, the I am with you starts with um, uh, Isaac, that what I call the divine accompaniment phrase. And uh, it, it, it's very integral uh, to the carrying out of Genesis 128. Uh, uh, they can begin to do it to some degree because God is with them, but they're not able to do it perfectly, of course. And so um, uh, Genesis uh, 28 is uh, actually 26. This is still Isaac. And then 28 is Jacob. May God Almighty bless you, make you uh, fruitful, multiply you. <laughs> Um, and uh, we continue with Jacob. Uh, I'm God Almighty, be fruitful, and multiply. Uh, and at the end, I'll give the land to your descendants. Now, it looks like that this command, this, this, this Genesis 128 is going to be fulfilled because in Genesis 47, uh, as they, they lived in Egypt, they became fruitful and became very numerous. So that's action. It's not saying that's what you will become. They began to do that. And if you look at the bottom there, Exodus 1, 7, and verse 12 and 20, it repeats. It says, they multiplied and they swarmed. Various synonyms for multiplying and swarming, multiplying. So they were beginning to all intents and purposes to look like they were beginning to fulfill Genesis 1, 28. But of course, they don't. And then if you notice the bottom references to Jeremiah 3, Ezekiel 36, Zechariah 1, Daniel 2, Isaiah 54. We're going to see that all these are places where there is a prophecy that finally Genesis 128 will be fulfilled and, um, and Eden will be extended to all the earth. So we'll wait on that. But you notice I say at the bottom here, note son of man and son of God. Why do I say that? Because the passing on of the Adamic uh, mantle through uh, the passing on of Genesis 128 uh, means that these latter figures are like Adam. And Adam was uh, uh, 
certainly a, a, a son of God. Wait a minute, where does it say that? It doesn't say that in Genesis 1 to 3. Well, the end of uh, Mark uh, or the end of Luke, where it turns the uh, genealogy upside down. So it ends with Adam. It ends with Adam, the son of God. So clearly the New Testament calls him son of God, but Old Testament scholars usually aren't satisfied with that. And so uh, Genesis, Genesis 5 says that uh, uh, Adam bore a son in his image. Uh, image language, therefore, is inextricably linked with sonship. Okay. God bore, uh, Adam bore a son in his image. Okay. So if we go back to Genesis 1, Adam's in the image of God. That's sonship language. Let's just let Genesis 1 be interpreted by Genesis 5 there. That's all we're doing. So uh, Adam was a son of God. Uh, all these other figures are uh, sons of God as well. Of course, he's a functional son of God. He's not the son of God in the uh, same way Jesus was, um, though I'm, I'm going to comment on that. Certainly, Jesus was such an obedient son. No one could be that obedient, that is perfectly obedient, and, and because he was uh, divine, truly uh, uh, the son of God in that sense. But um, he was also a son of God in the sense that just as uh, Noah and uh, Abraham, patriarchs in Israel, were sons of God, by the way. First time Israel's called son of God is in Exodus 4. Uh, uh, he talks about, you know, my firstborn son, Israel. Uh, Hosea 11, 1, also referring to the Exodus out of Egypt, have I called my son. Another passage, Israel is called son, God's son, the son of God. Why? Because they were to be obedient in the way that Adam was to be obedient. And so, um, but also son of man. Uh, there, the, the Noah and uh, the others are considered to be the son of Adam. Man is Adam. They're sons of Adam because that uh, uh, is passed on to them. And so uh, Jesus also is a son of Adam. And when he refers to himself as son of man, it's from Daniel 7, 13, and 14, which is alluding back to Psalm 8. I can't take time to talk about it. But uh, Psalm 8 is talking about the ideal eschatological Adam. And uh, Daniel's referring to that. And Psalm 8 is the most explicit psalm referring back to Genesis 1 to 3. So, um, Son of Man, uh, Jesus calls himself, is really rooted in what we're talking about here. Ultimately, he is able to perform the covenant of works that Adam was not able to do. And by the way, the covenant of works was not just not to eat of the tree. It was also to obey Genesis 128. That's part of the whole complex there. Okay. So um, uh, the, the command in Genesis 3 was sort of the tip of the iceberg, the key focus that if, if it's obeyed, you'll and you're obeying also Genesis 128. Most people don't see that the covenant of works includes Genesis 128. I think it does. So, um, uh, so Jesus perfectly uh, 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 does the covenant of works that Adam should have done. Uh, that's part of Genesis 128. And so um, uh, what we want to do then is go a little bit further here. And uh, I want to comment on something now. So I, I, what I've showed you, and I've gone through it a little bit meticulously, uh, how Genesis 128 is applied to Noah, to uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to Israel, and then to end time Israel, where, where it will be accomplished. Um, what commentators apparently have not noticed, some notice the passing on of Genesis 128, not all of them, but um, uh, something that they haven't noticed is when that commission of Genesis 128 is passed on, it's always in the context of small scale sanctuary building. I'll say that again. Whenever Genesis 128 is passed on, or it's to Noah, or especially the patriarchs, uh, it's always in the context, even of Israel, of small scale or even ultimately large scale sanctuary building. Okay? So uh, it's initially carried out, of course, by Adam in the garden. He was supposed to enlarge it. So it appears to be not accidental that the restatement of the commission of Genesis 128 to Israel's patriarchs results in the following. What do we have here? Well, we have the patriarchs doing six things. Number one, God appears to them. And number two, they pitch a tent. 
in, in Hebrew, it's an ohel. In uh, Greek, that's translated as a tabernacle, a skene. Um, and then uh, it's on a mountain. And fourthly, they build altars. They worship God, literally calling on the name of the Lord, usually with the Hebrew word karah, which probably included sacrificial offerings at the place of the restatement of Genesis 128. And then the place is usually called temple. Notice it's called Bethel, the house of God. That's what it means. Uh, there, there's one case where it's not called that. And then this is interesting. I had only noticed these five. And then I was reading an Old Testament scholar uh, who said, there's usually a tree in these locations. I thought, why would there be a tree? And I hit my head and say, stupid. Uh, <laughs> It probably refers back to Eden. That's why you got to have a tree there, okay? So um, now let me just give you one example where you have this uh, small-scale altar building and, and small-scale sanctuary building in the case of Jacob. And, and so we're going to read. I'd like someone to read for me here uh, if you uh, have it on the overhead, but you can get your Bible. Genesis 28, beginning at verse 10. And, and we're just going to read through. Uh, really all the way to verse 22. Can anybody offer to, we want to read Genesis 28, 10 to 22. And um, first of all, just read uh, verses 10 to 14. Anybody want to help me on that? Yes, sir, please. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. And read verse 14. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Wow, there, there's a Genesis 128. But you see how it's applied? It's expansion. This is amazing. Uh, he's, he's to extend to the whole earth. Uh, he's to extend to every direction of the compass until the whole earth is uh is blessed and, and and you can see here in verse 12 that uh what's happening the place where god's revealing himself this is the place where heaven intersects with earth and that's what the temple is for god's special revelatory presence uh, uh in, in the back part of the temple holy of holies intersected with um with the earth and so you can see that the idea of the temple begins to be introduced here together with genesis 128 and it continues, it begins explicitly to be called the temple. Continue at verse 15 uh, through 17. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. He recognized, since this was the gate of heaven, where heaven intersected with the earth, that that is temple. And that, therefore, this was the house of God at that point. Um, continue reading at uh, verse 18. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel. Okay, stop. Bethel, which means house of God. Then notice how verse 22 concludes. The stone, which I've set up as a pillar, will be God's house. So he sees an extension, you see. He sees an expansion again. And he says, uh, and that, that's the key thing I wanted to point out here. So uh, you get Genesis 128 inextricably linked with temple building. Why is that? Because it was inextricably linked with temple building in Genesis 1 to 3. Uh, you have Genesis 128, how's it to be carried out? As Adam being a king priest in uh, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. And then, in fact, I'm not reading things in that this, uh, this six fold pattern that we looked at 
uh, really is about temple building is apparent from First Chronicles, where uh, it narrates David's preparations on the screen now uh, for building the temple that Solomon will accomplish. And David's preparatory actions all include those sixfold elements, except the tree. There's not a tree, except figuratively. Uh, there's the tree in the holy place. Um, so uh, uh, all the same temple building patterns of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are repeated in David's building activities, which I think confirm that those activities of the patriarchs were indeed small-scale uh, uh, temple building activities. So um, uh, let's see here. Yeah. Notice David begins the preparations on a mountain, Mount Moriah. He experiences a theophany, the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth, as, as was the case with Jacob. At this site, David built an altar to the Lord, offered burnt offerings, called out to the Lord, Karah in Hebrew. Furthermore, David calls the place, quote, the house of the Lord God, because this is the site of Israel's future temple to be prepared by David and built by Solomon. So uh, now this confirms that those patterns with the patriarchs is indeed temple building activities. And so what we really have with the patriarchs is they're building you know, these small scale, uh, smaller uh, local sanctuaries. And the point of it, they're in the promised land and they're all really pointing to the bigger temple. It's to be expanded. Remember, Jacob says he's commanded, go to the west, north, east, west. And then he says, from the stone, a temple will arise. Well, all of these point to the big temple, the sanctuary first, or the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and then the temple. Remember, the, the temple, the uh, tabernacles integrated into the temple by David. Um, so, uh, when we come then uh, to Israel's tabernacle in the wilderness and later temple, it was really a reestablishment of the Garden of Eden's sanctuary, since that's what these small-scale temples were doing uh, with the patriarchs. So, for the first time. Um, God's unique presence with his people is uh, repeatedly and explicitly called a temple. We do have it called a temple earlier, but now it's just repeatedly uh, in, in very explicit form called a temple with Israel's temple. And so uh, we've already seen how the Garden of Eden had essential similarities with Israel's temple, which shows that Israel's temple was a development of the Garden Temple. Uh, and again, why? Why was it the development of uh, the Garden Temple? Because Israel took on Adam's commission, as we've seen. They were a corporate Adam. They were a son of God who should have obeyed like Adam. And thus also they were a son of man. That is, they were a son of Adam, should have done what Adam did. Uh, intriguingly, they are called son of man in Psalm 80 in verse 17. And actually, if you read Daniel 7 in the whole chapter, you'll see that the saints of Israel are identified with the Son of Man. So uh, something else that is true of the Eden Temple, which has not yet been mentioned, is that it served a little earthly copy, a model of God's temple in heaven, which would eventually encompass the whole earth. Now, it's not so clear there, but it is later in Scripture. Uh, Psalm 78, 69, something amazing is said about the temple. Uh, and it says this. Quote, God built the sanctuary like the heights, the heavens. He built the sanctuary like the earth, which he has founded forever. In some way, uh, this structure that we're going to look at here, hard to believe, but it resembles the heaven and earth. Doesn't look like that to me. And you've just got the very back part here uh, being the Holy of Holies. Uh, where, the, where the two uh, angelic beings are in the very back, and then the stairs lead down. It's not clear there were stairs. May have been to show that there's a little hill here. Why would that be? Because Eden was on a hill. And so uh, then you got the holy place in the middle there where the lampstands were and the, and the table of the uh, uh, bread of the presence. And then here's the courtyard outside the building. So those are the three parts. It doesn't look like the heavens and earth. And by the way, besides 78, Psalm 78, 69, Exodus 25, 8 through 9 and verse 40 also show that the tabernacle 
uh, was to be a copy of the heavens and the earth. So uh, now, uh, God then has modeled the temple in some way. We're going to have to see what way to be a little replica of the heavens and the earth. Isaiah 66, 1 says, quote, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? Here's the point. There's no house you can build for me that will be an eternal dwelling. Yes, I've commissioned the tabernacle and uh, the temple. It's only temporary. Why? Well, it's because we're going to see uh, the temple was symbolic of the heavens and earth because it represents that God's presence was eventually to break out of the back room of the temple and fill the heavens and earth. So there is there a, is there a house you can build for me? No. Eventually, the tabernacle will become uh, obsolete. Why? Because my presence will fill the heavens and earth. That's the idea here. And you can see the expansion idea. So God never intended then that Israel's little localized temple lasts forever. Like the Eden tabernacle, Israel's temple was a small model of something which was much bigger. God and his universal cosmic presence, which could never eternally be contained by any earthly structure. So Israel's temple was a miniature model then. of God's huge cosmic temple, which was to dominate the heavens and the earth. So it was a model not only pointing to the present cosmos, but it was a model of what the coming cosmos would be. The new cosmos it was a miniature model of that coming temple. Now we want to see that. And so I want to talk about how was the temple? This doesn't look like a model of the heavens and earth, but let's see how it might have been. Um, okay. Remember that in the, there were three parts, the Holy of Holies, the holy place in the middle, and then around at the courtyard. And so we want to look at those. The, uh, uh, I'm going to contend that the Holy of Holies represents the heavenly dimension, which you can't see. That the holy place in the middle represents uh, the starry heavens that you can see. And then that the courtyard represents the earth and the sea. Now you still can't see that. Uh, right now you're, you're saying, really? That's weird. So let's look at that. First of all, let's look at the, um, the Holy of Holies, okay? Let's look at that and, and why uh, that might be a representation of the uh, invisible heaven where God and his angels dwelt. And First of all, we, we can say that um, that we know from Revelation, well, from Isaiah 6, Revelation chapter 4, that angels, uh, we have four cherubim around uh, uh, the throne, and uh, probably they are seen as symbolic guardians of God in heaven. And, um, and so in the Holy of Holies, you have those statuette uh, angelic beings guarding the Holy of Holies. Uh, that probably represents uh, the angels uh, uh, around God's throne in heaven. And then uh, we'll say B. Uh, secondly, the... Um, <clears throat> The curtain uh, that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place probably represented the division of the heavenly from the earthly. So we'll just mention the, the significance of the curtain here. On the outside of the curtain was a picture. Uh, we know from Josephus, who lived in the first century and was a priest and was in the temple, he said that the outside of the curtain facing the holy place uh, there was on it embroidery of the sun, moon, and the stars, so of, of the scene creation. Uh, so that, and we're going to see that that's part of the reason that that middle place was considered to be symbolic of the starry heavens, but it also represents that what's inside of it is not the seen heavens. It separates. The, the physical heavens separate uh, 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 the invisible heavens. Um, 
And likewise, um, the, the Holy of Holies uh, was the place that's called uh, the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the footstool of the Lord. Um, the place where the heavenly dimension comes down to the earthly God is seen as sitting on his throne with his feet on the Ottoman, if you will. I don't want to sound sacrilegious, but on the Ottoman of uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And, and that's why it's called the footstool of the Lord. Um, so we'll say here, um, the Ark uh, is considered the footstool and what that really suggests is that God is in heaven with his legs, legs extending down metaphorically, uh, anthropomorphically, uh, uh, down to the Holy of Holies. Um, so uh, another uh, point here is that uh, even the high priest could not enter um, the... Uh, The, he could not enter without producing an incense cloud. He could not look directly on God's presence, which again shows a separation from uh, uh, the priest, between the priest and uh, God who cannot be seen. So we'll talk about the, uh, the incense cloud. Um, furthermore, Um, no image. There is no, in all the ancient Near Eastern temples, you have an image. There's no image in the Holy of Holies. I think furthermore, it shows that this represents the invisible sphere of God's presence. Um, so uh, uh, th those are just some suggestions. Uh, they point to the idea that the Holy of Holies represents the invisible dimension of heaven. Now, the holy place represents the starry heavens that can be seen. We'll say Holy of Holies equals invisible heaven. Here, the uh, holy place represents the visible. <clears throat> Heavens or sky that you can see. Uh, first, the curtains of the holy place, intriguingly, were blue, purple, and scarlet, probably representing the variated colors of the sky and woven into them also were bird-like creatures. Um, so uh, first of all, we can talk about the colors then, probably representing the sky that you can see. Uh, maybe you can even think of sunset here. But second, the lampstand had seven lamps on it. Why is the lampstand there? in a, a holy place, what had seven lamps on it, in Solomon's temple, there were 10 of them. So if you peer in, it's a little dark in there because of the curtains, if you peer in, it's like a solarium. You see 70 lights in there. Uh, it looks like the stars of heaven. Um, and uh, this symbolism is enhanced by observing, and you'll notice, um, uh, I guess I'll put it on, on here, make more. Um, Uh, that's not too clear because it's over something like that. That is, that is Mayor. Um, um, that's an R. Um, I had it written on another slide here, but uh, the, the Hebrew word. Um, Meor is uh, used for the lights, especially the plural, meorot. You just add a th to the 
to the end of, of this here, <laughs> that's the plural. And here it would be, uh, you know, I'm not including all the vowels in the English there. Um, so, uh, so what difference does that make, my wife will say. Um, well, um, it's used 10 times for the lamps on the lampstand. And guess where else it's used? Anybody want to take a guess? Fourth day of creation. Thank you very much. Genesis 1, 14 to 16, where it refers, the Maorot, the Maor, refer, it talks about lights and the greater light there, where it refers to the sun, the moon, and the stars. I think that's more than accidental. It's the only other place in the Pentateuch where Maor occurs. Lampstand, lights, and, and, and the lights. I think the lampstand represents the sun, the moon, and the stars. It's talked about in Genesis one, therefore. So it appears to have been designed to represent the creative work of God, who, as Isaiah 40, uh, 22 and 26 says, quote, God stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent, the dwelling. I think that's more than coincidental language. Quote, and it's God who's created the host of stars to hang in the tent. Likewise, uh, Psalm 40, uh, Psalm 19, four to five says, in the heaven, God placed a tent for the sun. <laughs> Plausibly, this may be the reason that the holy place was all covered with gold. Being, uh, having an Eastern entrance, if the curtains are open, sun would shine in and there would be this sheen on the gold, just as there is a reflection of the light sources in the heavens. Um, and, and we can say, uh, and let's see, that's point C, D. Let's talk about Jewish interpretation of the lampstand. Josephus, born around 37, 38 AD, uh, witnessed the um, fall of Jerusalem. He was a priest, as I said, he, he saw that the uh, on the curtain facing the holy place, uh, was embroidery of the sun, moon, and stars, which further, I think, indicates that's the symbolism of the holy place, okay? But also, he said about the lampstand, that the lampstands represented the starry heavens, especially um, the seven light sources that are visible to the eye of the ancient person, underscoring that this section of the temple symbolized the visible heavens. Now, that's Josephus, uh, there's another scholar, Jewish scholar, first century. His name is Philo. He says the same thing. So that doesn't, they're not canonical. Okay. These are just like early commentaries, just as you would treat a modern commentary. Sometimes they can be wrong, sometimes right. These are, we're pushing back the commentary material here on the lampstands really far. This is first century commentary. And I think there's reason to believe it. So um, then, thirdly, how can I erase all this now? On the bottom, there's a trash can. Uh, in, the, in the middle, there's a little menu bar. Okay, can I start over now? Start writing? Yeah. Okay. So, courtyard. That's the third place. Remember, I said it represented uh, the um, earth and the sea. Uh, and this identification is suggested by that large molten wash basin uh, in the large altar in the temple courtyard. The wash basin is called the Bronze Sea. Huge. We're going to talk about that. And the altar is called the bosom of the earth. So there's an identification here with sea and earth, at least in some way. The altar was to be an altar of earth in the tabernacle. Uh, an altar of uncut stone, identifying it even more with the natural earth. So both the sea and uh, uh, the bronze sea and the altar appear to be cosmic symbols, earthly symbols associated in the mind of the Israelite uh, with the seas and the earth. The symbolic nature of the bronze sea probably is indicated by the fact that you had to get to it only by a ladder. Uh, it was seven feet high. 
and that's where the priests did wash. Now there were uh, uh, smaller waist high uh, wash basins uh, in the courtyard that were for others to wash in. This was mainly for the priests, but it's not easy to get there. And the, the, the hugeness of it, you got to get there by a ladder, uh, probably indicates something about its symbolic nature. And in fact, around this big, huge bronze sea uh, were 12 bulls entirely, quote, encircling the sea and, quote, lily blossoms decorating the brim. That would also seem to be a partial miniature model of land and sea surrounding the seas of the earth, land surrounding the seas of the earth. Very interesting. That's 2 Chronicles 4, 2 to 5. The 12 bulls, which supported the wasp wash basin, were uh, one bull faced east, one west, one north, one south, uh, in indicating that, again, we're talking about something that relates to the whole earth. And the oxen, there were oxen, uh, also 12 oxen that were uh, pictured um, holding up the sea and designs of lions and oxen were on the huge wasp basin. Uh, on, on the side, the sides decorating it. And that points further to an earthly identification of the outer courtyard. So the outer courtyard also was associated with the earth in general because that's where the Israelites could come. And remember, Israel represented, they were a corporate atom. They represented humanity. In fact, that's why God chose them. They were to be a model to humanity. They weren't a very good model. Um, so the cumulative effect of these observations is that Israel's temple served as a little earthly model of God's temple in heaven, which would eventually encompass the whole earth. And when we saw the picture of the temple, it did not look symbolic in that way. But I hope now you can see that uh, once you're in and around it, um, one could begin to perceive how the different parts represented uh, uh, the different parts of the cosmos. So the inner sanctuary of God's invisible presence I believe, would extend to include the heavens and the earth. That's why you have the symbolism. Why? Because eventually God's going to break out. And um, uh, he's going, his presence will cover the visible heavens and earth and cover the land and the sea. Um, so uh, they're going to be consumed by God's holy of holies presence. Uh, again, this has to do with Eden. God was to break out of Eden, right? through his priest, king, Adam, and his progeny. And eventually his presence would cover the whole world. So why have uh, the temple represent the uh, heavens and the earth? Show, he's not going to be confined always in that back room. That's temporary. His presence is going to fill the earth. How's that going to happen? Well, he's going to break out and fill the heavens and the earth that the temple symbolizes. You know, whenever a school or a business, sometimes a church decides to expand and build a new building, they get an architect to make an actual model. I remember I was a member of a church in New England, and uh, it was a small church. It was really, really old, and they, they were getting bigger, and they said, we've got to expand. They got an architect, and uh, the architect made a model of the church, the new church, put it in the, in the narthex, and every time we passed through, we saw it. And never once did I or my wife think, oh, this guy's a great model maker. Never once did we just look at that as a model in and of itself. This is a model that pointed beyond itself. It pointed to expansion. And, um, and so you, would, you, you saw the sanctuary, you saw the parking lot, bushes, Sunday school rooms, a fellowship hall. It was, you know, all there. So you could look at that little model. You never said, oh, well, that's a neat model. Now, usually you looked at it, wow, that's going to be, that represents the expansion of uh, uh, our church, and, and that's what the temple represented. It was a small scale model, symbolic reminder to Israel of the task God wanted them to carry out. Same task that Adam should have carried out, but did not. Israel was to carry out. Um, they did not subdue the earth and expand the local boundaries of the temple. Uh, they were to have done that, spread his presence. And very interesting, the land of promise is uh, not unusually called the Garden of Eden, um, Genesis 13, 10, Isaiah 51, 3, Joel 2, 3, Ezekiel 36, 35. Why would it be called the Garden of Eden? Because probably this idea of expansion. Um, 
It's it, it, Israel has something to do with the Garden of Eden. They were to be having the mantle of Israel. They were to expand, and um, they were to be the Garden of Eden that would be expanded. Now, um, there's some very important passages here. Our question and answer time, unfortunately, will be filled with uh, me finishing this lecture. We can still have questions and answers if the remnant wants to remain afterward. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, here. I'll put, I'll put it up. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Good. So, um, what we want to look at, I want to look at some passages now where this expansion is clear in the eschaton, where at the latter days, the expansion of the temple is going to happen. That's what we're going to look at here, because I want you to see that uh, even more clearly. So, um, if you notice, uh, yeah, uh, look at this passage. And here we got old and the old. Remember I talked about old and the old? This is huge. This is massive. Back. Genesis 1.28 is a beautiful example of the old and the old. It, it, it's used elsewhere throughout scripture. And we saw that. In fact, there were two PhD dissertations in Wheaton done on Genesis 1.28 in the Old Testament. And there had already been a book published on it before that. And there are more dissertations that could be published on it. Just on Genesis 1.28. It's amazing. Well, here's a case where you do have Genesis 1.28 reused in Isaiah 54.3, but through Genesis 28.14, which is alluding back to Genesis 1.28. You can see uh, Genesis uh, 28, your seed will spread out the west, east, north, south, and your seed, all the families of the nations will be blessed. Notice what uh, uh, Isaiah says, you'll spread out to the right and to the left, your seed will possess nations. Well, you need to uh, look at the preceding context. Isaiah 54, 2, that's what it says. Now, this is 54, 3. 54, 2 says, enlarge the place of your tent. Oh, my gosh. Stretch out the curtains of your dwelling, spare not lengthen your cords, strengthen your pegs. So I think the idea of your tent there is not just your typical Israeli tent. Uh, that you're living in. I think it's really talking about the tent, the tabernacle represented by the temple. And then it says, for you're spread out to the right and to the left, your uh, uh, seed will possess nations. This is an allusion back to Genesis 28, 14. Let me even see if my Bible has that in its margin. Oh my gosh, yes. <sighs> Trusty New American Standard. Verse three, it has Genesis 28, 14. If that is an illusion, and indeed it is, then Isaiah 54 is talking about the same thing as uh, Genesis 28. It's talking about how uh, Genesis 128 is going to be expanded through expanding a temple. That's what Genesis 28 was about. If you remember, we looked at that in detail about Jacob. So here we have it, a good example of how the tent is to be expanded. And then we can look also at Daniel. Remember Daniel? Uh, the statue is destroyed by a stone cut out from heaven without hands, and it becomes a mountain, and the mountain fills the earth. That might probably even be an allusion to Genesis 1.28 there. The mountain fills the earth because the mountain represents the kingdom at the very least, okay? Genesis 1.28 is about kingship, isn't it, and expanding it. But we're going to see Remember Adam's a king priest? We're going to see that there's something also about temple here. So all I'm arguing here is that Daniel 2, that stone is a growing temple. Okay? Weird, isn't it? But that's the case. That's biblical theology. You, you get things unexpected here. Let's look at this. So I want to demonstrate it. Uh, first of all, Isaiah 2, 2 to 3 in point 1 utilizes a mountain to symbolize Israel. And the image is integrally connected to the temple. The mountain of the house of the Lord. It says, in the latter days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will grow. Oh, my gosh. A growing mountain temple. Temple on top of a mountain. Uh, and then what I'm saying is the unique uh, connection between Isaiah. I think that Daniel is using Isaiah here. And um, Isaiah is talking about a temple, definitely. Secondly, a close link between mountain and temple is generally made throughout the Old Testament. Temple is always on Mount Zion. So that's another indication that probably the Daniel 2 stone growing into a mountain is in some way connected with a temple. 
Thirdly, Daniel 2 and Isaiah 2, uh, as temple texts, are both introduced with the same phrase, in the latter days. In the latter days, about the house of the Lord will grow. Daniel says to the king when he introduces the an interpretation of the vision, O king, God has shown you what must come to pass. Or uh, in the latter days. Um, so, um, and, and both portray the mountain as, as growing, being raised among uh, the hills. Here, uh, we're going to skip that. I don't have time to go into that. Further indication that the stone of Daniel 2 is associated with the temple, point seven, uh, comes from the Gospels, which allude to this Old Testament passage. The stone, which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. That's the Daniel 2 stone. A number of commentators recognize that illusion. So that um, the stone from Psalm 118, uh, that's what's being talked about at the beginning, that the builders rejected. Is, is a temple stone. And it's identified now with Jesus, showing, of course, that he's the beginning of the temple that we've already talked about yesterday and we'll look more at today. Another link between the stone mountain uh, of Daniel 2 and the end time temple was that both are not made by human hands. Remember, the stone's cut up, cut, uh, uh, cut out without human hands. Uh, it's the New Testament that repeatedly refers to the new end time temple, quote, alarmingly or surprisingly as, quote, not made with hands. Uh, that's too coincidental. Um, so, um, and it will look at, uh, at this passage. Uh, so, also, um, I'd like you to turn to Ezekiel. Uh, actually, Jeremiah 3 first. Jeremiah 3. And then we're going to see Genesis 128 and temple expansion. What I'm trying to do is to show you, hey, there really is this idea of expansion. Okay, this is not just some weird uh, notion <clears throat> that commentators or I have come up with. But Genesis chapter 3 uh, and beginning at verse 16 refers to Genesis 128. It'll be in those days when you are multiplied and increased in the land, and they'll say, no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind. Or shall they remember it? Or shall they miss it? Or shall it be made again? In other words, in the end time temple, there's going to be no ark of the Lord. No, It will not be mentioned because it's not there. Well, what's going on then? Verse 17, at that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all the nations will be gathered to it. See, it was the temple which was God's throne in the Holy of Holies. Um, that's, that's very evident from Psalm 11, 4, Ezekiel 43, 7, uh, Daniel 7, 9, that God's throne was in heaven, and that was his heavenly temple. Uh, so that uh, now that throne in the Holy of Holies, it represented part of his uh, throne in the heavenly temple. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was the bottom part of that throne where his legs rested. Uh, that was going to expand. And here it seems expanding to the city. So no longer will the temple be the uh, throne of God. The city will be. And now we begin to get why. The new heavens and earth is not just a garden and not just a temple, but a city. It is temple and city are the same. And since the temple represents garden, they're all the same. So it begins, the temple covers the city, but it goes further than that uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27. I'd like you to turn there. It, it shows that there's an expansion from uh, uh, Jerusalem to the whole promised land, chapter 37. And we'll look at verse 25 first. Uh, and they will live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers live. They'll live on it. They and their sons, their sons, sons forever. David, my servant, shall be their prince. So they're going to live on the land. This is the promised land. Now notice, 
verse 27. Uh, well, the end of verse 26 says, I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. Verse 27, my dwelling place will be with them. Now in Hebrew, that with them uh, really should be, I think, translated over them. Literally, my dwelling place also will be over them. And I'll be their God. They will be my temple. Uh, it's Alehim, Alehim, uh, all plus them, him. Uh, over them, probably not just with them. That's too general. Over them. What does it mean? The tabernacle will be over the whole promised land because verse twenty-five has said uh, they'll live on that land. So his 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 tabernacle will be extended. It'll be over that whole land. And um, finally, I want you to turn to Zechariah chapter one. Zechariah one. Verse 16, therefore says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. Well, wait a minute. He's talking about building a house. When you talk about building a house uh, in the Old Testament, uh, you need measuring lines. Okay? You need to measure things, right? Why is he talking immediately about measuring a city? I think because the house is the city. Well, that's a big supposition. So let's keep reading. Chapter two, verse one, I lifted up my eyes. I looked, behold, there's a man with a measuring line in his hand. Here we go again. Something's being built. I said, where are you going? He said to me to measure Jerusalem. See how wide it is, how long it is. Behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out. Another angel was coming out to meet him and said to him, run, speak to that young man saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around Jerusalem, and I will be the glory in her midst. Well, uh, what the, this is talking about God's special revelatory presence, his fire, his glory is no longer limited to the back room of the Holy of Holies. Now all of Jerusalem is the fiery presence of the glory of God. So this is another example here where he talks about building his temple. All of a sudden he said, let's measure Jerusalem. And uh, the reason is because now that's going to be the holy sanctuary. So another case where city is equated, I think, with temple. So Israel receives the same commission as we've seen as Adam and Noah. Uh, they don't carry it out. Uh, this great mandate to spread the temple of God's presence. Isaiah 49, 6 says, that the Messianic servant would be a light to the nations, that Israel was not. They should have been a light in a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, going out to the nations as being mediators. That was, that's what priests are between God and the people. Uh, their only view of the nations was they should be judged by God's presence. And they believed the temple represented that they were elect and that would protect them from being destroyed. They had no sense of an expansion of the temple. So God sends them in out of their land into exile again, like Adam, because of their sin. He starts the process of temple building all over again, but this time he plans that the local spiritual boundaries of all the past temples of Eden, Noah's Ark, Israel's temple, would, would be expand, expanded finally to encompass the whole earth. So our last section here uh, is titled, Christ and his followers are a temple in the new creation. What happened to God's promise that Israel would carry out the Adamic commission? Christ does it, and we do it in him. Just to give you a little uh, a tip of the iceberg on that, Colossians 1, 6, and 10 applies Genesis 1, 28 to believers. Now, the reason it does is because chapter 1 and verse 15 says that Christ is the image of God, and we reflect his image when we come into union with him. And so we partake of what he has done. He has fulfilled Genesis 1. So we begin to do so. Listen to Colossians 1, 6. The gospel has come to you as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. And it's been doing in you since the day you heard of it. In verse 10, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to him. Please him in all respects, bearing fruit 
in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And uh, X uh, also refers to Genesis 1, 28 in the same way. Acts 6, 7, Acts 12, 24, Acts 19 and 20. I'm not going to, for time, I'm not going to read them. Uh, but it, it uses that language and applies it to uh, the fulfillment of what Christ has done in relation to the nations. So um, we know that the Messiah was expected to come and build the temple. Uh, in fact, the second temple, it refers uh, to a branch who is to come and says he will build the temple. Chapter 6, verse 12 of Zechariah. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the honor, sit on and rule on his throne. He will be a priest on his throne in the council of peace between, between the two offices. You see, after the fall, priesthood and kingship is separated. Now, when the Messiah is to come and build the temple, it will come back together again. Now, that was expected to occur in the second temple didn't occur the reason is the end of chapter six um all this will take place this temple this glorious temple will occur if you completely obey the lord your god they didn't so this second temple eventually of course is expanded by herod herod tries through his own efforts to expand isn't that interesting he keeps adding on but he has he, he understands this a little bit and uh but then it's torn down in 70 AD. So that temple, that second temple, was becomes a foreshadowing uh, of another temple of the branch who will come, who will build the temple. And, and, and referring to the Messiah, also 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13, speaks uh, of the same thing typologically about Solomon. He doesn't do it, but then uh, the Messiah will do it. So... Christ is the epitome of God's presence on earth as God incarnate, continuing the true form of the temple, which actually was a foreshadowing of his presence all along. Remember, the temple represented ultimately God's special revelatory presence. Remember, we quoted yesterday, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He templed among us and uh, we beheld his glory. So he's beginning to break out. God's beginning to break out through Christ from the temple. And Christ is indeed an extension of the temple. And um, of course, he says in John 2, tear down this temple in three days, I will raise it up. Speaking of the temple of his body, the text says. So uh, in fact, as you know, throughout his ministry, he, he said that forgiveness comes from him. Mark chapter two, it revolves around him, not the temple. So there's a transition going on even in his ministry uh, of temple functions uh, being uh, uh, allocated to him, he is the temple, and especially the escalated temple in his resurrection. So there are some, and I was going to mention this yesterday. Um, time here. Um, that, uh, you know, my contention is that Christ is the major beginning fulfillment of the prophecies of the end time temple and all which uh, Genesis 1 to 3 uh, look forward to. So the question is, if he is the beginning of that end time temple, Will there yet be another architectural temple built right before or after Christ comes back a, seven, a second time? Uh, some scholars think so, especially the dispensational scholars. Um, uh, and we hear about that expectation, that hope by some evangelicals. I think the focus upon a yet future physical temple as the fulfillment of the temple prophecies of the Old Testament is to ignore that Christ has begun to fulfill those prophecies and will do so completely at the very end of time. So I think the focus on only a physical temple as the fulfillment is like focusing too much on the picture of the temple in the Old Testament and not sufficiently on what that picture symbolized and pointed to. So let me, let me repeat that. The focus on a future architectural physical temple is to focus too much on a replication of the Old Testament uh, temple that was a picture, a symbol uh, of the cosmos that pointed to the future when God would uh, completely uh, fill the cosmos. I remember when uh, I was, uh, in fact, I was talking to someone today about um, 
my first year of graduate work in England, uh, I'd begun to date uh, my wife to be Dorinda uh, just for a few weeks. Then I had to leave for England. And then we wrote and we talked for a year. And um, uh, I remember she sent me a picture of herself. And so I'd get her letters and I would read them. And um, I, I remember uh, I was, I'd always look at her picture when I uh, read the letters. Uh, her brother was in the picture, so I cut him out. After that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but who knows? I had a friend who was in the same situation. He hugged and kissed the picture. I may have done that. Uh, and so now, if I'm sitting in my liver, living room after 45 years of marriage, and I'm sitting in a chair separate from my wife, she's in another chair in our living room, and, and I had the picture, that same picture, and I'm hugging it, and I'm kissing it. She's looking at me and <laughs> saying, what's going on here? You probably call our pastor and say, you know, my, my husband's been studying the book of Revelation too much. <laughs> so... Um, uh, no, that would be weird, wouldn't it? Why? My wife is the substance of the picture. It would be absurd, wouldn't it? You, you, don't love, you don't hold and focus on the picture when the substance has come. The substance of the temple has come in Jesus Christ. He's begun to fulfill it in an already and not yet way and will consummately fulfill it in the future. So when the type comes, Christ is the anti-type. He is, he is that which the Old Testament temples pointed. So when the anti-type comes, that is that which fulfills the foreshadowing types, um, when that comes, you don't go back again to that which foreshadowed. When the types begin to be fulfilled, they begin to be fulfilled. You don't go back again to the types. What is a type? A type is an event or an institution or person that points forward to the New Testament. And when those shadows are fulfilled, those pointers are fulfilled, you don't go back again. So to say there's going to be another temple, you're going back again. In fact, this is what's interesting. Some would say, Beal, you're being too symbolic about the temple. And um, it's very interesting that Hebrews 9 um, and uh, verse 11 says something very interesting about the Old Testament temples. Chapter 9, beginning at verse 8. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed, that is in heaven, while the outer or the first tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the time then present. Notice, it says that the first temple or the outer temple, the physical temple, was a symbol for the time present because the Old Testament age was continuing into the first century. So it's talking about how these Old Testament physical temples, it calls them a symbol. Well, that's weird. I thought I was the one being too symbolic. The physical temples are called a symbol. The word in Greek is parabole. It's the word used for Jesus' uh, parables. So... The physical temples are assembled, just as I've been talking about. So when what the symbol points to is fulfilled, you don't go back. Because if you're going back, if there's going to be another architectural physical temple, then you're just building something symbolic again. But what the, the symbolism has been fulfilled then. So, um, you know, when you get to Paul's epistles, uh, we talked about Christ being the temple. When you get to Paul's epistles, in fact, you know, uh, I think we're going to have a question and answer time. So let's take five minutes and I'll finish my lecture. So um, five minutes. And we'll see if we have time for questions and answers. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You know, it doesn't. Supposedly, the church in Ethiopia says they have the. That's a good one. I looked at the word and the word for covering is never far you to watch the especially for count so far. When God closed Adam, closed Adam, and we can sit and do a clothing. Yeah, there is this, you know, it says we're clothed with the new man, like the flesh was three tenths. That's the idea. Well, that's this is what he's talking about. This there. This is so. What, what do you see it referring to? This is another word. This is the concept at the end. Closed. It's amazing how man is seen righteousness. I need to do this with Christ. I mean, the, 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 so the jewelry, the jewels for you, yeah. is for you, like righteousness. Yeah, the jewels for you, like glory. Right? Not like right. that. Right. It's what I was saying. Yeah, no, I agree. So what I was thinking, to answer that question the way Brian said, so I've got this is like a seven inch signature concept that Shakespeare has in the parent texts. Yeah, he's the same. So one is 28, just going back to Genesis, but by way of. That's just 28. Yeah, that's I agree. Right, which, yeah. I think ultimately Exodus 28 is you know, in the ultimate scheme of things, pattern on Ezekiel 28. Historically. Well, because it's talking, if that's talking about whether it's Satan or Adam, it's talking about the Garden of Eden. Oh, 
right. the BT class here and in the Pentateuch class too. You open the bonnet. It's all at once. It's all tabernacle prefigures. There's the there's the chalice. Can't quite see it. The high priest, the uh, speaker, and the temple is yeah. the new hospital. So, yeah, like yeah. Maybe we should catch one. Uh, that's not the moment. Yeah. Uh, this is a morality. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I don't want to impute any of my weaknesses. I was kind of drawing that. It's all behind the thought. Yeah. 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 In numbers. There's the only other place they're using combinations. That they're used together. It's just. They built both of them. Okay, uh, I'm going to try to finish this. It's going to take about 30 minutes, and I, I have been told that actually uh, this event is scheduled until 12:30. I, I didn't realize that, and uh, uh, I think the schedule leaves that open. Um, says uh, uh, question and answer after 11:15. So uh, I'm going to try to finish. So what we found was you know, when you come. We've said, uh, yes, Jesus is uh, the temple. He's the beginning temple. Uh, he's where God's presence is, breaking out of the temple as, as uh, the special revelatory presence of God. And when you get to Paul, like 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you're the temple of God? The Spirit of God dwells in you. Or Second Corinthians, uh, or 1 Corinthians 6.19, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Or 2 Corinthians 6.16, for we are the temple of the living God. And, um, and so on. Uh, he just assumes the church is the temple. Where, where did the church become the temple? Where, where was the commencement? Anybody want to take a guess on that one? Where do you think it, it commenced? The very beginning. Because Paul's just assuming they're, they're already, uh, the people of God are already a temple. Pentecost? I love it. Why do you say that? The dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is where the spirit comes down. It rests upon them. Um, uh, I, I think you're right. And even that phrase, tongues of fire, comes from uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 30, uh, where it refers to God's heavenly presence coming down. There it's in judgment. Um, uh, and in an early Jewish work, probably around 100 BC called uh, First Enoch. In chapter 14, there's a vision. And it's a vision of a heavenly temple. And it's built of flames of uh, tongues of fire. And then you go into the holy place and he peers in to uh, the holy of holies. And, and it's an intense uh, place of tongues of fire. So tongues of fire represent the uh, 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 special uh, dwelling of God in his temple. Uh, and in fact, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can find the same thing that the, uh, when the priest comes out of the, of the, uh, of the temple, his the jewels on his shoulders are flashing tongues of fire because he's been in the presence of God. 
so I think when uh, the alert listener would know his Old Testament and uh, perhaps would know some of the commentaries on Isaiah, which I think probably uh, Enoch probably is referring back to Isaiah there. Uh, the tongues of fire is, is, is a phrase for God's special tabernacling presence. So when it's coming down, and resting on the people, it's building them into the temple. Um, in fact, I, I recently published a book, came out in April, it's called Union with the Resurrected Christ. And the cover is the cover of Pentecost. Um, now, Christ's face is not on it. Don't get anyone get troubled here. Uh, actually, his feet were pictured, but I cut that out too. So uh, what you have is, you have this, these tongues of fire coming down, and the people are looking up, and because I think that's the commencement of the people of God coming into union with Christ, especially as the temple. He became a temple, builds them into the temple. So I think that's the inception of it. And of course, we talked about lampstands, haven't we? We talked in chapter 11 about how the church is the temple and the lampstands represent uh, the church being the temple. So uh, Christ perfectly obeys and expands the boundaries of the temple from himself to others. What's the torn veil significance? What's going on there? I think so. God's break. I think it's symbolic to God breaking out of the temple. And I believe it's in Mark or Matthew where immediately where it mentions a torn veil, a Gentile centurion comes to know the Lord. Wow. Breaking out to the Gentiles. It's amazing. And so uh, that, that is really crucial. And, and, and I mentioned to you that I thought the Great Commission uh, had to do with temple. And so uh, let's look at that. By the way, before we do that, just, just a comment here on, on 2 Corinthians. Uh, Come out from their midst, be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is clean. Um, let me go to the first one. Um, I will dwell with them. I walk among them. I'll be their God. And that's dependent on two texts. Leviticus 37 is alluding back to Leviticus, or Ezekiel 37, referring back to Leviticus 26, where it says, I'll set my sanctuary in their midst, and my dwelling place also will be, remember, over them, not with them, and I'll be their God. And that's fulfilled, uh, where it says, you're the temple of the dwelling God. Then you get this quotation, as God said, as he prophesied, I'll dwell in them, walk among them, I'll be their God, they'll be my people. What's interesting is the literal interpreter here, uh, which are sometimes dispensational interpreters. What do I mean by dispensational? Let me give the bottom line of dispensational. The church and Israel are not the same. So the church has got to be raptured for, for Israel to be saved again and the tribulation at the end. Okay. So church and Israel are not the same. And so they would say here, church can't be the temple because it's yet to come. Because they conceive of a temple only as a physical temple. Church can't be the temple. This text says that the Old Testament is being fulfilled in the church. So, and it's because it's the Holy Spirit. It's not an architectural thing anymore. It wasn't an Eden either, was it? No. In fact, when the temple's torn down, the first one, uh, Ezekiel 11 says, I'll be a sanctuary for you in the exile. Well, that wasn't an architectural temple. Um, so uh, this is beginning fulfillment. The literalists, says this has to be metaphorical. The church is like a temple. I call that the likeness hermeneutic, <laughs> which is very interesting. I'm often accused of taking things too symbolically. Here, um, yes, I do take it symbolically, but uh, uh, really, I just take it literally. This, this prophecy is literally fulfilled. Uh, I, I walk among you. Your God, and here it's fulfilled. It's, it's, it's the invisible tabernacling presence of God. But the dispensationalist says, no, this can't be the fulfillment because this is talking about a physical temple. So this is really saying they're like a temple. There's a big difference between like a temple and really being a temple. It divides a covenant theologian, the likeness hermeneutic divides a, a covenant theologian from the dispensational. And then we have the next prophecy also from Isaiah. And, uh, in Second Corinthians, come out from their midst, be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. That is Israel who is commanded to come out of Babylon. And so the Corinthians are to come out of the Babylon of Corinth. And um, by the way, these are priests who are carrying the vessels of the Lord to rebuild the temple. 
Uh, and so that's part of what this coming out in Corinth is to be. You should be a part of the temple. Then when we get here, let's look at this. Um, here, here's the Great Commission on the right. Uh, there was a thesis of Gordon Conwell written by a fellow, and I think he's right. So I've used it. I put noted it in my uh, Temple and Church's mission book. He says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Okay, that's Cyrus. So I think what Cyrus is doing here, he's telling Israel to go build the temple. And I think it's, again, it's typological. It's a foreshadowing event pointing to what Christ is talking about. So notice Christ says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Cyrus only says, on earth. So you see the escalation there. In typology, you always have an escalation. Okay. John 19, Jesus is a lamb. That's from Exodus 12. So he's not an animal anymore, is he? No, he's the Lord God. You have escalation. So then notice uh, at the end, Cyrus says, may the Lord as God be with him. And look at this. I am with you. And then Cyrus commands them, go up. And here in verse 19, go. So I think we have a number of illusions here that are um, very uh, important and uh, that go back to Second Chronicles. Why do they do that? To show that this event of Cyrus is foreshadowing what Jesus is doing. If it is, this is a temple building event. Because notice, what's he telling him to do? Notice the middle green part. Build him a house in Jerusalem. What does that correspond to in the Great Commission? I think it corresponds to making disciples and baptizing. That's how the temple is built. That's how the temple expands now. As more and more people are added to the temple, more and more image bearers are reflecting the image of God. Now, that's not going to happen perfectly until, that'll never happen perfectly until the end. I'm not a post-millennialist. Some think that I am after reading my book. I don't think this is saying, oh, there's going to be a golden age where this finally perfectly happens. No, I just don't think it'll happen. Christ will come and uh, he'll bring it to a completion himself uh, in the new heavens and in the new earth. Um, but uh, what I wanted to say, who has the Nesalon Alon 28? There's got to be someone who has the Nesalon Alon Greek text 28th edition. Anybody have that? Because I, because of baggage, I only had carry on and didn't bring my Greek text. Okay. Let's see here. I'm going to pull it up real, real quickly here. Um, And we'll put Matthew 28 in. Just one moment. <coughs> yes. Um, let me let me expand this. see it in the margins of the Nestle line. This is unbelievable. First of all, we've got Deuteronomy 12, 14. That's seen as an allusion to uh, uh, Matt, Matthew is seen as an allusion to that Deuteronomy text and uh, the language there get to it. Oh, well, I, yeah, it's, it's right here. Well, see if I can expand that too. 
There we go. Okay. The illusion, don't worry about the Greek text here, but uh, verse 20 says, teaching them to keep all things which I commanded you. All things which I commanded you. It's from Deuteronomy chapter, um, back again. Chapter 12, verse 14. I'm just going to um, read that briefly just to show you the context, 1214. How important. This is an illusion again. You, got, you would only find in the margin. Uh, 14 says, God says, uh, verse 13, be careful you do not offer your birth offerings in every cultic place you see, but in the place which the Lord your God chooses in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings. And there you shall do all that I commanded you, all things that I commanded you. And that is repeated in 2 Chronicles 33.8. It's a temple context. So that doing all things that I commanded you has to do with things that pertain to the temple in Deuteronomy. And in the context, ultimately, in Chronicles. And then notice, too, Haggai 1.13. What's that about? First of all, it's very difficult to find Haggai. <laughs> but we're going to try. All right, I got it. Haggai 113. And what's Haggai about, by the way? Rebuilding the temple, right? Amazing. All right. 113, Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord by, this, by, by saying, I am with you. Well, he's with him with regard to what? Um, so, by the way, Nessel Alon sees that I am with you as a reference back to Haggai. Hmm. As you saw, I think it's also a reference back to um, the Cyrus Commission. It could be to both. And, and he says, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people to do what? They came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So this I am with you is I'm going to empower you to build the house of the Lord. And, um, and that's really what the I am with you was about in the Cyrus Commission, too. The Lord your God is with you. And likewise, uh, in, in, Zerubbabel, uh, in, in, the, in the context of Haggai 2, um, the I am with you is, um, is repeated. Um, verse five is for the promise which I made when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. Well, what's this about? Well, he says, I'm going to fill this house with glory. Verse seven. So again, because I am with you in this context, back to Haggai, uh, repeated actually, uh, twice, um, is uh, a reference God being with them in building the temple. And so this, this reference here, uh, back to the passage. Um, this reference on the right part of the column, you can see then how the marginal references to Deuteronomy and to Haggai support this and further fill it out that this is about temple building. This is amazing. And you can see, this is not the Great Commission. This is the repeated commission given by Jesus, and it's climactic, no doubt, but he's repeating from Genesis chapter 1, ultimately, and verse 28. In fact, you'll notice it says Daniel 7, 13 to 14 there. That's the Son of Man prophecy. What's that? The Son of Adam prophecy. Daniel 7, 13 to 14 goes back to Psalm 8. Psalm 8 goes back to Genesis 1 to 3. You know, you can look at Snicker, uh, use of the Old Testament, the Old and that. Okay, so uh, th th this is very important then. So uh, Christ perfectly obeys. You can see the expansion here, right? You're going to the nations uh, and teaching them uh, to observe all that I have given you. So we're to continue that task of sharing God's presence with others until the end of the age uh, when Christ will complete it at the very end. Um, so, uh, indeed, this, this idea of, of temple building um, uh, will continue throughout the church age. 
until the whole earth comes under the roof of God's temple, which is none other than saying his presence will cover the whole earth. So the mystery of how John can see a new heavens and earth in 21.1 and the rest of the vision, he sees only a, a city in the shape of a temple that is garden-like has been solved. Now, I haven't mentioned bride. Why is the city called the bride? I'll abbreviate. If you go to Isaiah 62, it says that Zion and Jerusalem will be married to God in the future. And uh, they're called a bride there. So the city is also bride, you see. Uh, and it represents the intimate fellowship that God is to have uh, with the people. So the city really represents the people. They're also a bride. They're married to God because of this intimate saving uh, relationship they're going to have. So uh, the new heavens and earth are now described as a temple there. And, uh, and we've seen the reason why. In fact, chapter 21 and verse 22 says this, I uh, saw no temple in it. And there's no physical temple. Why? For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And their presence radiates out to cover everything so that the whole heavens and earth is indeed temple. The true temple is God's special presence, formerly limited to Israel's temple, and the church, uh, well, limited to the temple, and indeed limited to the church in this age, and then it'll be expanded to the whole heavens and earth in the new uh, heavens and earth. So uh, we might ask, I'll ask you quickly, why does Revelation 21, 18, which we read, why does it say the city temple will be pure gold? You know, it says there, uh, uh, in the material of the wall was jasper, the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Yeah, why would it be gold? Why would the, uh, the city be gold here? I think it's because, because of time, I'll answer my question. <laughs> I think it's because the entire Holy of Holies of Israel's temple uh, and the holy place was paved with gold, ceiling, walls, bottom. And what's happened now is that's expanded out to the whole earth, figur figuratively speaking. Okay, It's a figurative way of saying the whole temple is expanded to the whole earth. It's got to all be gold now. The Holy of Holies and the Holy Place has expanded. And, and you'll notice as we read this, three sections of the temple aren't mentioned. Only the Holy of Holies. Remember, its height and length and width are equal. That's the Holy of Holies from uh, 1 Kings. And uh, why, why, why isn't the Holy Place of the courtyard mentioned? Well, it's because they have fallen off like a cocoon. And uh, from which God's Holy of Holies presence has emerged to dominate all creation so that the symbolism of the temple in the Old Testament has found its meaning to which it has pointed. We might, we might say in regard to Genesis 1 to 3 that what we have here finally is a completion of intended design of Genesis 128 in relation to uh, garden temple expansion. It has happened. So we as God's people have begun to be God's temple where his presence is manifested to the world. We're to extend the boundaries of the temple until Christ comes through making more image bearers who will reflect God's image in the temple. We do that through God's grace. And this concept of a growing temple, uh, you find this in Paul at various points. I'll just mention one of them, and that is Ephesians chapter 2, where it says, that uh, the whole building, speaking of the temple in Christ, is being fitted together, is growing. Chapter 2, verse 21. The whole temple is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. You know, growing is an agricultural term. Temple is an architectural term. How do you combine the two? Well, I think we've seen. Okay? Because all, all of this organic... Uh, uh, garden imagery that's been put into the uh, architectural temple it represents the continuation and recapitulation of the garden. And so now this temple is to be expanded. It is to grow a temple growing in the Lord. It helps us understand those phrases and, and our commission that, that we are to be a part of that. And so basically, uh, how do we first experience God's presence in the temple? Uh, well, it's by believing in Christ. It's the gospel. 
trusting that he died for us. He came to life again as the Lord God of heaven and earth. And by the way, some don't think Eden could have been a temple before the fall because there's no sacrifices given. Oh my gosh, uh, the fall means that now when there are these temples, you've got to have sacrifices, but they will end once the fulfillment of the temple comes. Why? Because Christ is the climactic sacrifice. As Hebrews says, you don't need them again. It's another reason why we don't need another temple with sacrifices, which some think that is going to, is going to happen. It goes against what the book of Hebrews says. Christ is the last priest. He's the last sacrifice. And um, so uh, as we believe in him, the Holy Spirit comes into us and we become the temple of God. So remember, we're priests. We talked about being priests yesterday and priests are mediators between God and humanity. We are that. That's part of our evangelistic uh, uh, task. Um, priests are to pray. Uh, Isaiah 57 says the temple is to be a place of prayer for the nations. And um, priests are to teach. Uh, you don't have to be a pastor or teaching elder to teach. Uh, some degree, discipleship involves teaching. So in, in some ways, uh, that priestly aspect, if I can say it, uh, can be applied in, in different ways on, on many different levels. And um, also, uh, we're to be guarders. Elders are to guard the doctrine and the ethics of the church. And, uh, you know, generally speaking, we're to guard our families. Uh, uh, as uh, a small part of the covenant community. And finally, we're to offer ourselves a sacrifice. And so we talked about that yesterday. We all live a cruciform life. That should go down into the, uh, um, uh, into the weeds, if you will, and um, down into the small places of our lives where we sacrifice ourselves for one another as brothers and sisters, as mates, Sometimes that may come through persecution. Um, so we're priests as well. Uh, some say, how can you be a temple and a priest? Well, in the same way that Christ is a temple and a priest. Okay, these things overlap. That's why. And um, they can do that because God says so. So uh, how do we increase the presence of God in our lives? Well, how was Adam to do it? I think by continuing to believe in God and his word. Uh, Adam and Eve did not do that. They only had Genesis 128 uh, uh, to, to remember uh, as part of uh, the commission, as well as don't eat of the tree. Uh, when Eve is challenged, uh, she does not remember God's word very well. Either that or she's the first false teacher. I think she just doesn't remember God's word very well. And what, when that happens, uh, it, it causes a breakdown in her spiritual life where she falls into temptation. Uh, she forgets the word in crucial areas. Uh, if you remember, um, she minimizes their privileges by saying, we may eat, leaving freely out. In fact, the Hebrew says, you may eat, eat. She says, we may eat. She leaves, leaves the emphasis out. Um, she also uh, minimized the judgment by saying, uh, lest you die, when she quotes God. God did not say, lest you die. God say, said, lest you die, die, or lest you surely die. And again, the emphasis is left out. And thirdly, she maximizes the prohibitions by saying, uh, we may not eat or touch. God never said, don't touch. She becomes the first legalist. Uh, there, now, there are some who think that Eve did not misquote. In fact, one of my colleagues, Jeffrey Neos from Gordon Conwell in Old Testament, has written a book arguing that she did not uh, sin here. She did not forget. And so I've responded to him in my book, uh, uh, Union with the Resurrected Christ, uh, where I found it uh, important to go back to Genesis 1 to 3. And actually, there are six, not just three, six crucial areas where Eve forgets. And I think that uh, it's likely uh, that she did to get. And when that happens, the flood of sin comes in. The, the, the guard of the word is let down and sin, all kinds of sin uh, occur. And at that point, uh, what happens is that they fell and failed to extend the boundaries of God's temple. Christ, the last Adam comes. What happens when he's challenged by the devil? And by the way, uh, those challenges and the temptation in Matthew and Luke are a replication of Israel, uh, who was tempted in the wilderness, and they fell uh, because uh, Christ is presented uh, with a temptation uh, 
uh, by Satan. And when he responds, he responds with the reference, different references to, to Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 18. For example, it says, uh, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's from, I believe, Deuteronomy 8. I'm not going to go through it all because of time, but he responds in the way Israel should have. So he's true Israel. But the temptations conceptually are like those in the garden. And that's why in Luke, when it says it, the genealogy ends with Adam, the son of God, it goes immediately into the temptation. Because now we're, Jesus is going to be tested also as a last Adam figure. And he succeeds. He defeats the devil uh, decisively. That was the D-Day defeat of the devil for Jesus. And the rest is mopping up operations as he casts demons out. The rest of the church age is mopping up operations. Uh, though the devil is alive and well, he is defeated. Um, do we come to God's word daily? That we may be strengthened increasingly with his presence to fulfill our task of spreading that presence to others who don't know Christ. The only way I know how to experience the presence of God is coming to the word of God by faith and learning it, being absorbed in it, praying through it, and, uh, and, and so on. And I, I, I think that that is the main means by which we come to know God and we reflect him and we honor him. Um, so uh, uh, I, I'm not a charismatic. I, I, I don't think that um, you know, God gives visions anymore. Might give a vision occasionally, he's sovereign, but I, I don't think any one person has uh, the gift of raising the dead, for example, or of uh, healing the, the deaf and the blind. Uh, so, uh, in fact, when I was in uh, uh, graduate school, there was a guy, uh, I lived in a, in a law dormitory, and there was a guy that was a charismatic, and he got all excited. He said, oh, I've recorded everything that God gave to me, and I'm studying it. This is, this is, you know, it was kind of an addition to his Bible. And so, uh, you know, I don't think so. I, you know, I think that this Bible is the canon, and uh, we need to be careful of other things that claim to be. So, um we increase the presence of God by knowing his word, trusting it, obeying it, and then spread that presence to others. And, um, uh, and one way we spread that presence, which is evangelism, which is extending Eden to the ends of the earth. How do we do that? Well, it's by letting that presence shine through when we're in suffering situations. It doesn't have to be persecution. As I said yesterday, it could be an illness. If, it could be you've lost your job. It could be a family member died. How do we respond? Those become times, amazing times of uh, reflecting God's glory. And uh, we don't necessarily reflect it because we have the goal of evangelism in mind. It may be, but we do that because that's who we are. People in the midst of God's presence. And we have to remember that some people think we're living after the Bible. Um, and I think uh, that's not correct. We're still living in the midst of that redemptive historical story, a true story. And we're still in, how so? Because we're the beginning of that end time temple and being end time priests. And we are part of this story, uh, expanding the presence of God in Christ, the last Adam. Uh, one summer, my wife and I bought a rose of Sharon bush when we lived in Wheaton, Illinois and planted it on the north side of our house. And it was supposed to grow six feet tall, four feet wide, have flowers, and it barely even produced buds. And I realized, you know, it, it was too much in the shade. So for it to properly grow, we had to plant it in the sun. Yep. And that became to me sort of a uh, illustration. Uh, we need to live in the light of God's word, not the shadows of the world. A friend of mine defined worldliness in this way. Worldliness is what any particular culture does to make sin seem normal mm -hmm. and righteousness seem strange. And if we're not continually in the word of God, faithfully praying through it and with other believers, especially uh, once a week on Sunday, then um, we're going to think that we're strange. Isn't it interesting? Have you ever talked to someone who stopped going to church and they think you're strange <laughs> and they're normal? That's interesting. Um, really, we come to church to assure ourselves that we're not weird. We really are 
the normal people. <laughs> it's the ones outside who are strange. So, um, so that's crucial. Uh, we're to bear fruit. And uh, the mark of the true church is an expanding witness to the presence of God, or to our families, others in the church, the neighborhood, the city, the country, ultimately the whole world. But missions is everywhere. It's not just overseas. May God give us grace to go into the world as his extending temple, to spread God's presence by reflecting it till it finally fills the earth as it will, according to Revelation 21. And then that Jeremiah 3 text will be fulfilled. It says in the end time, people will say, quote, no longer the ark of the Lord in Israel's old temple. It'll never enter in their minds and be remembered. Why? Because the end time temple, which it points, has expanded to the whole heavens and the whole earth. These individual Christians and those in local churches and as a part of Christ church elsewhere need not merely share our lives and God's word with one another. We need to go out and uh, expand the boundaries of the church so that they will grow. And so uh, the end of this process has come. The main point of what we've been talking about is this. Main point of my Temple and Church's mission book that our task as a church is to be God's temple. So fill with his glorious presence that we expand and fill the earth with that presence. Until God finally accomplishes the goal completely at the end of time. This is our common mission. May the church of the 21st century unite in order to attain this goal. Then may the church, the true Israel and true temple experience the priestly blessing pronounced on Israel from the tabernacle. Remember the priestly blessing. We forget this. It's pronounced through the tabernacle as it extends God's tabernacling presence. Remember what it says. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Now notice what Psalm 67 does with that blessing, the priestly blessing from the temple. What does Psalm 67 do? It understands that blessing of the book of Numbers to have a worldwide goal, not just to Israel at that time. It says, God be gracious to us and bless us. This is 128. Cause his face to shine on us. His presence will be with us. That why? Why? Why would we have God's presence on us? Why would this priestly blessing be upon us? That God's way may be known on the earth. Expansion. Your salvation will be among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, therefore. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. Sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with uprightness. Guide the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth is yielded as produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us. Why? That the ends of the earth may fear him. Um, I'm going to show you a hymn that was written, and I think it was written as a result of uh, this teaching that I've been giving. I haven't asked the woman, but I know she was present. And so uh, I have this, and I'm going to read it. And um, you can read it with me uh, as a prayer with our eyes open, if you will. Um, here's uh, what she has written. That was bit of music by our, the musician. This was a college church in Wheaton. Uh, by grace, God makes a people. That's pretty small. I am sorry about that. Uh, if you can't see it, just trust me. Um, by grace, God makes people. I don't know if I can expand that. I don't think I can. On the bottom right. There's a slider in the bottom. There you go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that. Where, where'd you come from, man? <laughs> Out of heaven. Okay. Gonna have to go up. Okay. okay. By grace, God makes a people. Christ claims them as his own, lifts them up through Christ the Savior, Christ the cornerstone. Second stanza. By grace, God builds a people, his own temple pure, standing firm on one redeemer, one foundation, sure. Third stanza. By grace, God sends his spirit, his spirit and his word to fill and fortify this temple built on Christ the Lord. Fourth stanza. By grace, Lord, let your people stand firm 
Stand, stand firm and sing praises to our rock, our Savior, Christ, our coming King. Lastly, by grace, Lord, let your temple stretch from shore to shore, built on Christ who comes to claim her, is forevermore. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, come. Finish this temple building process. In the meantime, provide us with your spirit increasingly to, um, to spread your presence to the ends of the earth in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.